But let's tell you a little, about, a little bit about today's speaker. So today's speaker, Kim, is from Washington. She flew all the way down from Washington. Here's a fun story about Kim. So Kim is such an intense, like such a dedicated person that she was going to be speaking at an event in Cabo. She lost her passport like the day before flying out of Cabo or flying to Cabo. Had the, had the flights, had the hotel, had everything booked, and she was going to be on stage. She's like, what am I going to do? She's like, we'll figure it out. She flies down to San Diego. She walks across the border, gets on a plane in TJ, and flies to Cabo. Because we're like, well, how are you getting back? She flies back to TJ. She walks across the border, and she flies home to Washington. So, so that's, that's who she is. She's absolutely incredible. Another fun fact about Kim is that she is such an incredible leader. She's such an influencer. She has such a strong market presence that she has not one but two city council members on her real estate team, right? One of them is a city council member. Another one's a, um, the mayor of the town that she lives in. And she has a gold medalist on her team as well. So this is who we're learning from today. If she can attract a gold medalist, if she can attract a, uh, the, the mayor of her town, like think about what she can teach us. What, who would you have to be? What would your business have to look like for the mayor of Sacramento or the mayor of EDH or the mayor of Folsom or the mayor of Roseville to be like, you are incredible. I want to work with you. I want to learn from you, right? So that's, that's a little bit about Kim. Some quick real estate stats. Top 1% since 2005. She's been ranked the top 1% of real estate agents since 2005. So she's not a flash in the pan. She's been here almost 20 years. Okay, top 1% of real estate agents nationwide. And last year, she was ranked 18th in a brokerage of over 87,000 agents. She was the number 18 top producing agent. So everybody, please stand up, put your hands together, and welcome to the stage, Kim Frazier. Hey, everybody. So excited to be here today. Thank you so much for the wonderful words and kind welcoming. Um, what a beautiful city you guys have. Absolutely stunning, clean. I love the mix of the rural farmlands coming in, and then like great shopping and retail and all the new construction development. I'm sure the outer lying cities are just as pretty. I end up spending a lot of time like in LA and Anaheim and San Diego and don't get an opportunity to be more in Central California, except for when I'm driving my six kids 20 years ago back and forth to Disneyland from Seattle. That's a long trip with six kids under the age of 10 crammed in a car. The crazy thing is we would leave at like 8 or 9 p.m. If I was smart, I would leave at like 6 a.m. and then get in at like 10 p.m. No, we'd leave at like 8 p.m. and then go all the way through the night and try to stay awake. And one time I took the wrong turn and I was all the way to Modesto. Before I realized at 2 in the morning, I had to come all the way back to I-5 and make it the, way, the rest of the way down. So it's crazy. But you have a beautiful town here, and I'm really, truly honored to be here. So thank you so much. So I'll kind of go over some little housekeeping here first, a little bit about who I am. Um, my name is Kim Frazier. I've been a realtor since 2002. I'll be starting my 22nd year this May. Um, I have six children that range in age from 21, uh, 21 on the 26th to 31. I have eight grandchildren. Um, so I have grandkids that go from 1 to 12, so they are pride and joy. Um, my handsome husband, Chris, is here with me today, and we're business partners. Can give Chris a round of applause? He's over there. So... Um, We've worked together since about nine months in the business. Anybody here in the room work with their spouse? Please raise your hand. Wonderful. So um, it's a blessing and a curse, as we all know. I don't know if you're the blessing or you're the curse. So um, I like to think I'm the blessing, but sometimes he says I'm the curse. So um, I tell him that I'm the same person he was when he met me. I didn't change. So, you know, you get what you buy. So anyway, it's fun. He does what he's best at. I do what I'm best at. I love people. I love people. I love selling things. I um, bought my first house when I was 20 years old. I grew up um, with a single mom. We had food stamps, welfare. We lived in a mobile home. I was embarrassed to have people come to my house because it was when everything was green and green wasn't a popular color in 1982. The carpets were green, the couches were green, the curtains were green, and it was super embarrassing. And so I would tell people, like, hey, don't, just drop me off over here. It gets really confusing to get home. So I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about who I am growing up to who I am today. Um, 
the one thing I have a lot of, um, my talents and abilities are God-given. I'm the same person I was today that I was born. Um, I'm very blessed with the um, gifts that I have. And it's really, I think, about connecting with people and loving people and loving them well. And I think that's what helped me become a great listing agent and a great um, leader at EXP. Um, so I became a, my mom, I was 10 when my parents separated. I was the oldest child. Um, started working when I was 12. I've worked since I was 14 the entire time. I've never taken any time off. If I wanted something, I had to work for it. And when I was 20, I bought my first house. And so at 22, I bought my second house, had my first child, had my second one at 23, had my third one at 24 and a half, and I thought I was done. When I was pregnant, I became a single mom with my third daughter under the age of three. So we had bought our second brand new house. I went from working part-time for minivan and grocery money to um, having to work full-time because if I learned anything through being raised by a single mom and being the oldest child, helping pay for gas and groceries and all those types of things, we'd walk to the grocery store. We didn't have a cell phone. So if somebody wanted to date me, they'd literally have to call my neighbor. She would come get me. I'd walk across the street to her mobile home, and then we'd have a conversation. Then they'd come pick me up. It's kind of embarrassing, but it's, I am the way, I am the person I am today because of the adversities and the struggles that I overcame as a young child. And I think that God allowed me to go through that to take a glimpse of what was going to be in my future. I think if you've walked a certain walk, you're able to help people and you're more equipped than if you haven't had the struggles at all. And so because I had those struggles, um, it created a work ethic in me that if I wanted anything, I would have to work hard for it. Thank goodness I met a gentleman who was also an oldest child, whose mom was a single mom and had the same work ethic and drive that I did, and we wanted to make a better life for ourselves. So we met a couple years after I became a single mom. He had one daughter. I had three. The girls were three, four, and five. We could not rub two nickels together, not even two. Like, we're so poor. Here's my wedding ring, which I've had for 24 years. And it's from Costco, and it was $79. And I make over a million dollars a year in commissions, and I have my wedding ring still. So it's kind of a cool testament. But um, it's um, funny, like, where you start and where you finish, right? And so if you're at a place right now of struggle, um, it's not where you finish, you know. Um, got my license in 02. In 07, Chris and I bought a $4.5 million home, most expensive home in the county we lived in. Um, nobody told me the market was going to crash. So in 05, I sold 101 houses. In 06, I sold 80 houses. In 07, after we put down our $100,000 earnest money deposit, I was like, gosh, it seems like it's getting slower. But I don't want to lose that $100,000 non-refundable earnest money. Full speed ahead. So we buy it. 60 houses, 40 houses, 19 houses, which was better than the average agent in 2009. But when you have a $21,000 a month mortgage, it doesn't pay the bill. So we short sold our house the beginning of 09. Um, immediately after, I think it was a God thing, because immediately after we sold the house, I had 12 pending escrows. So it was funny that I just think it's really about timing. And then I was freaking out because I'm always like, oh, we could have saved it. But it was just not where we needed to be at that time. And it became a burden. We had the most beautiful home. We'd pull in the driveway. And I was angry. I was angry at the house. But it wasn't the house's fault. It was just the stress that the house caused us. So fast forward, moved back to our other waterfront home. So it wasn't like we were in the slums. We had kept our other house, moved back there, stayed for 10 years, ended up buying a nicer home than the one that we sold about three and a half years ago. So by the grace of God and hard work, we were able to right the ship. Um, how many of you were in the last real estate downturn? How many of you had your license through that? So about a quarter of the room. So I think we learned some valuable lessons about ourselves and about marketing and tenacity. If it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger, sometimes in business, sometimes in marriage, sometimes in friendships, sometimes raising your kids, right? So, um, so I learned a lot of valuable lessons, I think, through that. Um, and I'm a better agent because of it. And I'm a better leader to the agents in our group because I've been through that struggle. And I think having had a short sale back then, we were able to work hard, avoid bankruptcy, just work everything out of it, work our way out of everything. But as people are going through that, they can lean on the experience that we have. And so for those of us in the room that have been through the 07, 08, 09 through 12, can really help with those agents that have been in the market five or 10 years that are kind of going through the shifting market a little bit now. So make sure that you guys make yourself available and kind of be in a place of encouragement for other agents. So um, I'm kind of a testament that with hard work and determination, if you don't quit, you can make it. So that's a little bit of background about myself. Um, I've been with EXP, or oh, my pen, just a sec here. I've been with EXP 
CXP two years in June. I was in my prior brokerage, John L. Scott, for 19 years. Um, when I left John L. Scott, I was the number one brokerage out of 4,000 agents in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and parts of California. So that's a little bit of my backstory. Um, when I got my first house at 20, I loved the process. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so much fun. I bought my house for like $77,000. It was pretty affordable, brand new. Thought the process was really interesting. Two years later, bought my second house, bigger, a little nicer. Well, the agent would be busy, and so people would be in sight. And so I'm like, oh, I'll take the keys. I'll go help you. So I wasn't licensed, but I go open the door, and I knew the siding product and the roofing material and all of that. So I would kind of just take them as a tour, a little tour guide, and I thought, I'm going to get my license. And then I got pregnant with baby number two. Then I got pregnant with baby number three. And then I was a single mom. And any of you know how hard it is just to do real estate with young kids, but to do real estate with young kids and be a single mom is nearly impossible. And the fact that it's not a steady paycheck would also make it hard to make my mortgage. So I worked for Safeway at the time, and I went into management to work 40 hours a week so I could keep my home. At 27, I did my real estate clock hours, and I was going to get my license and met my husband and kind of got detracted, got off my course a little bit. And I sold Mary Kay Cosmetics and I was going to win a pink Cadillac. And, um, and I'm not over the pink Cadillac. Last year, I went out of the nail salon, and there was a pink Cadillac in front of me, and I'm like, I know I can get that. I know I can get And I have a Cadillac Escalade. Like, I have one. But the fact that I didn't earn it or win it is still inside of me, so that hasn't gone away. So I told my husband, I said, I'm going to sign it for Mary Kay. He's like, you are not. I'm like, I might. So it's $100, $100 for the kit. But I think... <laughs> I think, I don't know if any of you have ever felt like that, like there was a challenge that you haven't conquered. It's not even about the money anymore, you guys. I need the money to pay my bills, but it's bigger than that. It's about the lives I can touch through listing and selling houses. It's about being able to fly down here, and I'm so blessed and honored to be friends with Brent and James and Rob to um, invite me to come in from Seattle, and there's nothing that would have kept me from being here. I adore Brent um, and James and Rob. All three of them are phenomenal people, and um, um, I had uh, some other commitments that I took off my table today um, to be able to be here with you guys. So I'm really honored. So thank you for being here. And um, it means a lot that you would take time out of your day to listen to me. So hopefully you learn. Thank you. Hopefully you'll learn a couple things about listings. Um, the cheapest house I've ever sold is $67,000. Has anyone ever had a listing under $100,000 and you were not motivated to do anything with it? It's horrible. And you're like, I'm absolutely going to help you. And then I think actually I might have sold like a $40,000 mobile like my first year in a park. Oh, it was awful. It was like a little tiny single wide. I don't even know. I think I could be pulled behind a car. But it was really bad. And so, but it was, she was older. She was so sweet. She was a little elderly lady. And I'm like, of course I'll help you. I literally think it was $40,000. I just forgot about that until right now. But then I sold a $67,000 condo and I've sold a $127,000 house and I've sold a $4.5 million house. And so it's funny that the work's the same regardless of the price point, right? Would you guys agree? Yes. Marketing's the same expense regardless of the price point. So whether you're marketing to a neighborhood with $250,000 homes or you're marketing a neighborhood $2.5 million homes, the price for the postcard is the same. The price for the flyer is the same. All of the marketing stays the same. You might be able to do a few more fancy things like a luxury home magazine with the high-end stuff. But as I kind of take you through this process with me, you'll kind of see that I was very deliberate in trying to move our price point up. Because in the beginning of my career in 2002, my average price point was $150,000. Last year, my average price point was a million nineteen. Year before that, a million two. That was my average price point, not the highest, but the average. And so, I'm going to teach you how to be kind of intentional with getting that. So, if your average price point is three fifty or four hundred, how do we get that to five hundred? How do we get that to six hundred? So, even an extra five or ten or twenty percent over the course of twenty, thirty, forty deals will make a big difference to your bottom line. Um, the most houses I've ever sold in the year is. Um, 101 in 05, the least amount was 09, um, and I sold 19. So that's kind of the ebb and the flow. Um, I think we all face um, struggles. Did anyone have maybe a little bit more of a downturn in 2022 than they did in 2021? Did anybody have less sales? I did. I did. So I sold less houses in 2022 than I did in 2021. 2022, I still sold $50 million, but in 2021, we sold $80 million. 2020, we sold 76 million. So I think in a shifting market, how do you pivot? You know, how do you pivot? How do you provide value? How do you lean up your budget to be able to be sustainable so you're not a flash in the pan? 80% of all realtors fall out in the first 
two years and 90%, I'm sorry, in the first one year, 80% fall out, 90% in the first two years. And then when you have a shifting market like this, you're gonna lose about a third of the existing agents that wanna be full-time, but that are really struggling. And that might be some of you in the room today. I mean, there are times I've gone five or six months without a closing. There have been times when I've sold 21 in a month. You know, so it's just, it just the law of averages, right? So we'll kind of talk about that. We'll talk about open houses. We're going to talk about marketing. We're going to talk about lead gen, strategy, door knocking. I want this to be interactive. When I messaged Brent on Sunday, I was at an open house, and I had texted Brent, James, and Rob. I said, because when they asked me to come, I didn't. I thought I'd be up here 20, 30 minutes. I'm like, it's fine. That'll be easy. And I'm like, okay, so how long do I need to gauge the presentation? And Brent's like, hour and 45. I about choked. I was like, Ugh. I was like, you're joking, right? And he's like, no, I'm serious. You're going to crush it. I'm like, oh, my gosh, Brent. You're stressing me out. So then I thought, okay, how do I do this? Because I don't want this to be boring for you guys. I want it to be educational. I want you to be involved. I want you to take, you know, one to three things away from this. You don't have to take everything away. If you guys can come away with one solid item that you guys can put into your business today, it's a success. Okay, so just not be overwhelmed. This is going to be videotaped. You guys can go back and watch it down the road. Don't take frantic notes. And I'll be asking for some um, audience feedback and things like that. And if you need to go up and use the restroom, um, please do. Get beverages, snacks. You're not going to bother me at all. So make sure you're fluid, moving. Um, if you need to stand up and do some jumping jacks, we can do that too at one point as well. So we're going to start off with some geographic farming. So the success of our business, my business this last year, with Chris and I together, 55% of our business recently has been um, the as far as 55 percent of our business for the last 21 years is listing centric 45 percent of our business is buyer i would say the last five years it's probably 80 percent listings and 20 percent buyers i think that's because our ability to convert leads that call is terrible like i don't know i'm like sometimes what happens you guys ever outsource to so outsource some things and then you just don't pay attention to it well i kind of outsource my buyers and just kind of not really cared and not taking his hands on, as much of a hands-on approach i think i probably need to do that more but you ever have capacity limitations and just it's not your passion right now and so the last several years i think buyers were kind of exhausting in 19 20 and 21 during the pandemic in 2021 because I know your guys' market was frantic like ours was. Um, way Interest rates were low, way more buyers um, than there were houses. Inventory still at a low here. You guys are having a lot of new construction, which is awesome to see. But um, there's still kind of that balance, um, out, you know, still a little bit out of balance in the country. So um, we really have um, listings. You can control listings. You can control your time more with listings. Um, Brent likes to say listings have babies. So if you do this right, you can take this. And what I want to teach you is how we can spin this offer, additional business, additional listings, buyer opportunities, open house opportunities. Um, my first month I came to EXP, I had an open house July of 2021. I had two $4 million listings. Now, number one, to have one $4 million listing is crazy. But I had two in one month. One was a past client, and then one was through my farming and geographic farming. And so any of you sit open houses, raise your hand. Me too. Um, any of you hate sitting open houses? Raise your hand. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so sometimes you sit there and nobody comes, right? You're just like, this is such a waste of my time. The weather is horrible. No one's coming. This sinks. I can do like 10 other things in my three hours. But I just think, gosh, you know, I bring my taxes. I put the stuff aside. I bring my bills. I bring my work that I'd have to do at a desk anyway. So kind of shift your mindset on that. So for us, I had these two open houses in um, my farm area, and it was like 110, 112 degrees. Now, I know you guys are used to 110, 112 degrees in central California. In Washington, not so much. We're used to gray skies and rain. So I'm thinking, no one's going to come. It's like 113 degrees outside. This is ridiculous. 30-something people come to the open house. I didn't even have water. I wasn't thinking anybody was coming. There was no water. I'm giving it out of glasses in the cupboard. So and they're walking in the neighborhood. I'm like, you guys are going to melt on the sidewalk. So anyway, so I go to the open house reluctantly not happy about it, thinking of 5,000 things I'd rather be doing at home. So what do you know? I double end. I sell the house from the open house. So I double end a $4 million listing at a 6% commission. 
So 240000 So then the next weekend, I go to my other $4 million listing. I double end that one. In fact, multiple offers, $4.3 million. So I made $525,000 in one month off of two open houses. So if that doesn't change your attitude, like about open houses, I don't know what will. Now, granted, since then, I've not double ended anything, and 90% of them have been ghosted. But law of averages, I'm still making like ten grand a month. So <laughs> it's fine. But So if you just have something like that, and then I try to coach my agents too, it's a numbers game, right? And you've got to go to do the work somewhere. So what are the chances of you meeting someone at your desk at home or your kitchen table or being in an open house where someone's going to walk through the door? So you might as well position yourself somewhere where you have a chance of meeting someone than sitting at home feeling sorry for yourself. You can do midweek open houses. You can do weekend open houses. But we'll kind of talk about that a little bit further down. So geographic farming, does anyone in here have a geographic farm that they mail to on a consistent basis? Please raise your hand. So about 10 people, 8 people, okay. Are any of you interested in learning how to kind of choose a farm and figure out how to become the neighborhood expert in that farm? Please raise your hand. Okay, cool. So we're going to start with that first because I feel like that is a great place. You have to kind of figure out if you're going to become a listing specialist and kind of be able to control your own destiny and control the market, you need listings. You don't control the market if you have buyers. You just don't. The buyers will run you ragged. They're not loyal. Um, Chris and I, he'd been in the business with me about, gosh, only like a month or two. He quit his job. And we had six kids. And I'd been in the business not quite a year. And I had three calls in a week of buyers that got sucked away from me from open house, new construction, and just ended up buying. They called me and told me, because they really like me. They're like, Kim, you're so nice. I'm so sorry. But we ended up going to this new construction site. And they said, if we don't use them, we can't buy the house. I'm like, OK. Thank you. And so then I'm that person, like, if you see me, like, I hug everybody. Like, I literally love everyone. And I was like, okay, try not to take it personally. And this is before I got, I developed thick skin. Because real estate, if it doubled anything for you, it'll eventually develop thick skin. Um, you become calloused. Just kidding. I, I used to be nicer before real estate. <laughs> ha, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I was a lot nicer. I'm nice now, but I was really nice then. But um, so the second one calls, and they're like, oh, my gosh, you're so sweet. But we went to this open house, and she said if we wanted a shot at the house, we had to write it through her. I'm like, who was it? And I wanted to cut her. So then I'm just, and I knew who she was. I was like, you. And I wasn't, I was only an agent for a year, so I didn't have any clout to really be calling anybody out. I was just like that little turkey. So um, anyway, the third one calls, I start crying. I'm literally sobbing in my front yard. I don't even want to go tell him because I'm like, how do you lose three buyers in a week? And you need this job to pay the bills, and you have six little mouths to feed. My youngest daughter was two weeks old when I got my real estate license. Like, literally, I, she was two weeks old. I nursed her. I went to Olympia, took my test back in an hour and a half and nursed her again, and we were back to business. So she literally, she's licensed on our team, but literally two weeks old. And so we have all this responsibility, all these mouths to feed. You could be the nicest person ever, but sometimes people just get sucked out for no reason. Has anyone ever had someone sucked away from them that they thought was loyal to them and you're working with them? Anyone? How does it feel? Anybody? Shout it out. How does it feel? It hurts, huh? You take it personally. You're like, oh, it's just business. No, it's personal. Especially when it's your, like, cousin, your parents, and, you know, your brother. You know, I love that. I love when family, oh, I don't want it to be personal. Yeah, you're like, no Christmas presents for you. But, um, but it's like, it's hard not to take it personally because this is what we do. And you want people to like you. You want people to trust you. Um, we work so hard. Like, I've never worked harder than for anybody else than I have for myself. And I think that's the beauty of this because we have unlimited potential and rewards that come with this job that no one else is going to pay us, right? The, the benefits of this are fabulous. You can take, like today, we took today off. Like we flew down here last night. Um, if you see me hobbling a little bit with a limp, I was packing my suitcase yesterday and I missed the step in my bedroom. We have a laugh, like an elevated floor where our bed is. And I was talking to one of our daughters, and I missed a step, and I twisted my knee, and I fell to the ground. And I was like, call dad. So um, he called, flew upstairs. I'm like, I can't stand up. Like, I literally can't walk. And so he's like, what are we going to do? Can we go? I'm like, I can't not go. I'm like, I can't do that to James and Brent and Rob. I'm going to go. So I'm going to medicate myself. So if I sound crazy, it might be because I'm on naproxen. 
like possibly. So just get, I did like half an hour ago, but um, just to make sure my knee wasn't going to give out on me. But it's like when you make a commitment and a commitment to people that you care about, um, you're going to be there. And I didn't want to let you guys down. I didn't want to let them down. So whatever it took, I could be up here on crutches or a wheelchair today, but I wasn't going to miss this opportunity to speak to you. So anyway, sidetrack there for a second. So we're going to go back to geographic farming. When I chose the neighborhoods, Chris and I together, um, where we were going to market, number one, price point matters. And it's, there's an evolution, like there are probably 10 neighborhoods that we marketed to that didn't perform that we dropped. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about that. I will not market to some, a neighborhood that I don't love. Like if I wouldn't live there as a first time home buyer, a move up buyer, an investor, I'm not going to market to that neighborhood because if I don't like it and I don't feel good about it, I can't with integrity sell that community. I can't. And if you know anything about me as you get to know me, that's the most important thing, my integrity and my word. And so I'm not going to lie to you. If you want me to tell you honestly about a house, like I'm not going to try to talk somebody into something that I can't get them out of ever. Like if there are power lines, I'm like, hey, I'll sell you whatever house you want to whatever house you want to buy. But when we go to sell this, those power lines are going to be an issue. That busy road in front is going to be an issue. The meth lab next door is going to be an issue. <laughs> like, I'm not so worried about the paycheck. And it might take them six or 12 months, and they might get sucked out. But I'm not going to be the person that talked them into something that I see with my realtor eyes that they don't see, that they're so excited about. So I'm always like, hey, I don't want to like disappoint you or be devil's advocate, but you probably should be looking at this because I think this could be a problem down the road. So I think if I get anything from you guys, get take from this today is always work with integrity. It's going to come back to you tenfold. Don't try to talk somebody into something that is a bad investment because it's not going to benefit you and it's not going to benefit them. So pick a community that you love and you want to become the go-to realtor. When vetting the community, you need to be paying attention to turnover. Typically, it's about 7% is what you want to see for a community. I think it's going to be interesting. Those are historical numbers. I don't think we have enough information from the 3%, 2 and 3% interest rate era to the 7%, 65 7% interest rate era. I think people typically are going to stay a little bit longer than where they were before just because rates have doubled. Now, I bought my first house in 1990. The rates were 10%, and I bought it down to 95 and I thought I was doing so good. When you're 20, you're an idiot. You don't know anything. But that was what rates were. You know, money market accounts were 7.75. A basic savings account was 5%. So it's all relative, right? And the house was $77,000. Second house, um, 7.75 in 93. I thought anything below eight was a deal, right? When I, in 2003, when I was a realtor, the rates got to 6%. I'm like, this is free money. This is free money. I'm going to sell so many houses. Sold 101, right? So that was good. But then when you go to an artificially low interest rate environment for year after year after year, it creates a false sense of reality. For people. And so I was cursing under my breath or out loud, like all spring and summer last year, I'd call my lender, what are the rates today? I almost was like laughing. I'm like, please tell me they're higher because this is funny. Um, and, and it was just annoying at the same time. And so um, that obviously has an impact, you know, on business. So I think geographic numbers, when you're looking at turnover ratios, they typically want to see about 7%. I think people, unless they have to move, they're having more kids, they're getting a divorce, somebody died, they're moving out of state. A lot of people are going to kind of stay put a little bit longer, I think, than before just because of the rates and the uncertainty in the market and the looming recession that we're in. Um, so I think those are some things that might impact that. So just kind of take that number of 7% at a grain of salt. You don't want to buy you don't want to market to a neighborhood where nobody moves. It's like the most incredible neighborhood ever, and nobody ever leaves unless they die. Like, you're going to spend a lot of money in marketing that you're not going to get back because no one ever moves. The other thing, too, is everybody's like, oh, I'm going to market to this brand new, new construction neighborhood. That's fabulous. You can get in early. But you're going to spend three to five years before those really start to turn over. You'll have the ones and twosies that get a job relocation or get fired or a divorce or death. But typically, you're not going to see those numbers for five to seven years. And so you can literally invest tens of thousands of dollars waiting for those to turn. So I would say you want to pick something maybe in the five to 10 year spot to five to 10 year range. Um, as far as turnover, people start to get antsy. And it takes about a year to get going you know, on that farming. Um, but if you invest and you invest wisely, you know, that will come back to you. Um, one of the things about farming, too, we've marketed at 
like a monthly to like 10,000 homes in a month in like five to six different neighborhoods. So we've heavily invested in marketing. So when you guys have questions about that, at the end of the slide, you'll be able to see my phone number and my email address and everything. I want you guys to reach out to me and I can give you the materials that we have here. And I can kind of tell you and coach you a little bit on what to do and how to do it. I'm happy to do that. Um, and you're like, hey, look at these numbers. What do you think? You know, but you're better off going with a smaller farm that you can mail to consistently than a huge farm of 2,000 homes that you can only afford to do once a month or every other month. You want like two mail outs a month to that neighborhood at a minimum to be able to be front of mind. If you can really front load it, maybe partner with a lender that's doing some business that has money still, um, <laughs> still has business. Um, yeah. And maybe go to a bank. So see if they want to market, but um, that they can kind of help absorb some of the costs. If you can go out there monthly or weekly, if you can go out there weekly and just inundate them they don't even know that you're selling or not selling they're like wow that girl's busy we just listed a house we just hold an open house we just went pending we just went sold that's four marketing pieces for that one house in a month boom 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 they don't even know put the front photo for the one the kitchen photo is the other the backyard photo is the next one the aerial is the next one people are not even really paying attention to what the address is on the postcard they just see your face and your name and not really putting two and two together yeah some people will know it's the same house but if you change change the front focus of what the house looks like, people will just see that you're busy and that you're doing activity. So um, you want to do your homework to see if there's a dominant agent in that market. That doesn't mean you stay out. That just you figure out how to beat them. What are they doing? So it's also good if you have a friend or you can bribe someone in the community to start collecting the pieces. Say for every piece you give me, I give you a $5 scar Starbucks card. And so you can trade Starbucks cards for postcards or newsletters. So the more that you can get your hands on pieces that are coming in their mail and make it like, hey, if you get me five, I'll send you to dinner. You know, make it a game for them to collect them because you want to see what the competition's doing and you just want to do it a little teeny bit better and a little bit more consistency. If someone's mailing out once a month, they might as well light the money on fire, honestly, because it's not gonna give you enough traction to move you forward um, in that community. So try to figure out who you can know or go make a friend in the community at the coffee shop, figure out who lives there, look at like the farm, you've gotta know someone, even put on Facebook like, hey, does anyone know anyone who lives in this community? And you'll have like five people and then just pick one that looks the nicest and then ask them and bribe them. So that's what I would do. So um, let's see, saving the marketing materials, contact your local title and escrow rep so they can get a community farm for you, which is phenomenal. So if you're door knocking, like we get a sheet, we get a, a list of people who have moved, who's in the neighborhood. They can always also give you a list of what the balances are if anybody's in default on their property. Um, so if they have equity in their home, they can also do a little scenario of who's most likely to move. So partner up with your title rep, and I can also connect you with mine here that can connect you with a good one here that can give you that information. I use Tycor, which is part of like Chicago Title, that whole family, Fidelity Chicago Tycor. But they have some phenomenal um, Tycor Tech Farm uh, pieces that they can utilize. And it also, for those of you that happen to be um, using KV Core as your CRM, the KV Core can tie into the Tycor Tech Farm so they can sync together. So if you happen to be out door knocking, you can have your iPad with you or your phone and it'll pull up right here. Oh, it's Susie Brown's house. Okay, great. So I'm knocking the door. Hi, Susie. I'm Kim Frazier with eXp. How are you? Good. Hey, we're holding your neighbor's house open down the street on Saturday from 12 to 3. We're having an early entry for all the neighbors from 11 to 3 because I know every, or 11 to 12 because I know everybody is super um, nosy and wants to know what the neighbor's house looks like inside. And sometimes you have a friend or family member who wants to move into the neighborhood. Would love to have you. In fact, we're having a little brunch for the neighbors and a little early entry prize. Um, here's a flyer. If you're able to make it, I would love to have you. And she was like, okay, great, I'll stop by. And so, and you can also always say like, hey, if um, this house sells quickly, which it might, have you thought of moving? Have you ever thought about, you know, at the right price, would you be willing to move? And they're like, oh yeah, we're actually gonna move next year. Or, okay, great, I'll follow up with you. You just make a little note on that little Tycor app and then you know who to follow up with. But it will literally follow you um, on the map all the way through the neighborhood so you know exactly who whose door you're knocking on, you can make notes in the app. So that's something really cool that I would encourage you to do. 
So um, let's see here. We've dropped off things at the door like sports calendars, door hangers, and open house invitations. We've done heavy on those. Um, the community information is really helpful. It provides you with a place to make notes. To um, um, With anyone you happen to make contact with, you can start to build out your database. So if there are people that you've um, started a rapport with when you knocked on the door, you can put that in there and say, hey, we've got this great newsletter. Would you mind if I put you on my list? And it can be a mail out piece. Like I'll show you our mail out piece. We have a community newsletter that we do monthly, and it's heavy card stock. It's like a decent card stock. It's that weight. It's that weight. Can you hear that? So um, it's not thin paper like this. Um, then it'll have like neighborhood stats. Um, what does the rest of the year hold for the housing market? That was one of the articles. Um, Kim's Corner, which I don't write, Chris does. So um, it has a calendar. It has um, the median home values. For this neighborhood, like first quarter of last year, the median home price was $2.67 million. Um, fourth quarter, 2.5 million. So this is the one neighborhood that I had the $4 million listing in. So this is the highest price point neighborhood that I market to. We've sold nine homes over $2 million in the last three years out of that neighborhood. So it's been pretty nice. It's, I don't know, close to, well, over 600,000 in commission probably, just from that neighborhood alone. So it's really nice. And then we have like a graph with interest rates, which might look like a roller coaster. Actually, it looks like this, a straight line going up. Just kidding. So, um, but it'll have like a graph of average price per square foot, average days on market, list and sales price ratios. Um, Curbio, we'll talk a little bit about that. It's a program that we happen to have at the company that I'm at. Um, I know Compass agents, they have like a concierge service. There's a lot of real estate brokerages now that um, will allow you you to pay to get the house fixed up and the clients can pay at closing so we'll be touching on that a little bit but we also just kind of advertise that a bit for the consumers as well so that's kind of nice also so um, print materials that we um, use to attract prospective listings we do newsletters we do community specific um, the calendar we do magazines so I'll kind of show you that we have magazines so these are kind of some samples of the brochures that we've done that we mail out to a postcard. This is, whoops, ah, I dropped it. Where'd it go? I, I saved it. Sorry, that lid, the ledge on this is not as thick as the material I brought. So this is the $4 million house that I so it was sitting at in 113 degree weather that I thought no one was coming and 30 people came to. And I ended up bringing a, finding the buyer at the open house and it was literally like the last 10 minutes. So you ever have those open houses where you wanna leave and they're like, just a few minutes. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, no problem, come on in. So they come in and they're like, oh, we live up the street, but this view is better. This view is better than my view. So it's a beautiful view of like Sammamish and Mount Baker. And they're like, we love the view. I'm like, okay, awesome. They're like, I, they have like a two and a half million dollar house. They're like, okay, well, we don't need to sell our house, but I think we want to buy this one. I'm like, perfect. So we bought that, and then I sold like a one point three million dollar um, investment property for them too. So just from that open house, you know, I met those people that I wouldn't have normally met. So that's kind of cool. Um, another piece that we do here's another house in that same neighborhood that we did. We did a kind of a smaller brochure flyer. We included a Matterport. Can you guys see that? There's like a little Matterport virtual tour on there. Does anyone ever use Matterport for virtual tours or 3D tours? Just one, two, maybe under 10 people in the room, 10. So I highly encourage you, we own our own Matterport camera. So, and they have a new Matterport camera that's like a stick. It's like a little stick. I think it's a couple hundred dollars and it goes faster. I haven't purchased it yet, but you put on a little tripod and it goes super fast and it shoots a 3D tour. If you were to pay for a Matterport, it can go anywhere from like 300 to six or 700, depending on the property. I shoot them myself even. So um, I can go in and, and zip in and zip out in like an hour to two hours for most houses. But one of the cool benefits, it'll create a floor, a floor plan for you. So not only is it creating like a 3D virtual walkthrough, people can see it all across the country country, all across the world. It gives you a really nice floor plan. Um, it also does measurements. It does room measurements now. It'll tell you the dimensions of the room sizes. Um, so this was kind of a cool one. And then this we marketed and um, kind of showed everybody in the neighborhood. This went to like 200 homes, 300 homes of all the places that they could find that listing um, where we placed it. Um, 
we sent like the web that we put the um, the links for the cinematic video, the 3D walkthrough, its own personal branded website that we had. This house sold for 2.2 million, but this was just a little sample flyer. And then we put it in a gold, we put it in a really pretty gold envelope. And I hand addressed 200 of these sitting on my couch. And so they had a personal handwritten, invited them to the open house that we did for the neighborhood. So that's something that we've done. This is kind of a fun little piece that we did in marketing. Um, these are some other um, pieces that we've done um, in the postcard realm for um, some of our listings. This one I sold for $2 million last year on the lake, and then this one I currently have listed just under $3 million on a lake in my neighborhood. But um, we do nice brochures, some nice quality print brochure material, heavy card stock, full bleed. Um, I think it's important when you're marketing and farming to a neighborhood, whatever you do, you do to the best of your ability. Um, you don't want to actually, you know, cut corners on that kind of stuff. Not only does it represent your listing, it represents you. So you want it to be top notch. These cost me about a dollar fifty a piece. I have some that are matte. Some this is a gloss but really good quality. This one, when they did the fold, was slightly off, like by an eighth of an inch on the back, so that was annoying. But um, when you, details matter, so details matter. So for Chris and I, when that came back and this fold was slightly off, we're like, are you kidding me? Nobody else probably noticed, but we did. So if you are, don't have really good marketing chops and can build that, hire someone like on Fiverr or a VA that can do this for you. You can get a VA right now for like four to $8 an hour in the Philippines that are fabulous. So if you guys want some help too, on VAs and hiring a VA. We just hired one recently. Um, we can get you guys connected with the site and things like that. So for like under $300 a week, you can have a full-time virtual assistant that can create all of your marketing materials. You can interview them and they can do your videos and all that kind of stuff. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. I'm going to clear this little counter for myself here, make, give myself some space. So this is um, a sample of like one of the magazines. This is my, I live on a lake. I live in Lake Taps. If you want to come see me, you can. So we live, and this is a neighborhood magazine. We have the inside cover. We have the inside cover of the magazine that we market to. We've been in here probably, what, four or five years now? Five years? So with the inside front cover, and so we have new listings. Any of our listings get advertised in there. When we don't have listings advertised in there, we'll like brand our marketing plan. We'll do staging. We'll do Curbio. Um, and so this one, we have three different marketing plans, a platinum, a gold, and a silver. So if I'm competing with like somebody who's wanting to hire Redfin and wants to kind of skimp out on, on the commission a little bit and doesn't care about the added services, I can kind of meet them to match what they were pricing at. And then mid-range and then full service with like moving services, staging services, all of that in our platinum plan. So I can talk with you guys a little bit more about that as well. So that is a little bit about what we do there. We um, do offer a moving credit um, in the platinum plan. We'll give them like a $1,500 credit towards their moving expenses. Um, it could be a staging credit. Um, we ended up creating a whole staging wing of our business, which I'll be talking about, um, which we can offer complimentary staging to our clients now. Um, and then we kind of went over the postcards. So that's a little bit about farming. Um, any questions that any of you guys have right now in regards to farming um, that I can answer for you so we don't have to wait till the end? Back of, the, back of the room. How do you do staging? Complimentary staging. So we now have staging that we've purchased, and honestly, it's probably about $200. $50,000 worth of staging that we've added to as time went on. What would happen is sometimes they would charge three or $4,000 a staging job. And I'm like, well, if it's a million dollar listing and it's going to be $35,000, $30,000 in commission, I'll spend three to 5000 to get thirty. You know what I mean? So I'll spend 10% of it ahead of time. Now, it's hard if you don't have a budget right now to do that. So you can offer, um, you say, hey, it's really important that we stage this. At closing, I'll go ahead and credit you half of it. I'll credit you all of it. So it can be complimentary. If Depending on the price point, you can kind of gauge what you're willing to give up. If it's a $10,000 commission, maybe it's 1500 bucks. Like, I will give you 1500 Your staging is going to be $3,000. i will split it with you, and I'll credit that back to you at closing. So there's no cash out of pocket. So if for some reason they changed their mind and I've gotten smarter at this over the years because I've staged stuff that didn't sell and then we ate it so there's that cost of doing business right so um, I would say maybe offering a credit um, you can offer like a credit of 1500 well you know the staging is going to be 3000 so we have a $1,500 moving credit we have a $1,500 staging credit um, and that might be maybe you're staging the living room the dining room and the primary bedroom 
and an office and the kids rooms don't get staged but a lot of things you can do too is even work with the clients furniture that you have go spend go to Marshalls and Home Goods that's typically where I go or TJ Maxx and you can get bedding from $40 to $100 for a full set seven piece you'll have like your bed skirt the sheets the pillows the shams all of that so even doing light refreshes like that, even if you're not bringing in wholesale furniture, some lamps or lampshades can go a long way, fresh towels in the bathroom, pillows, just some greenery or accessories. So you could do kind of a light vignette for under $500 to 1000 for a house. And then when it sells, you just take that with you and you have that in your inventory for the next one. So that's kind of some of the ways that I've done it over, over time. Yes. Yeah, we, right now, we've pulled back a little bit first quarter of this year just because we had a slow fourth quarter. Um, and so we decided to kind of pull back just because there wasn't a lot of inventory coming on. And a lot of those neighborhoods we've, were layered pretty well. So we can pull back a little bit and then jump back in. We don't lose a lot of momentum. But pretty much in our market, no one's mailing anything. Are you guys kind of seeing that too? Like we're not getting any pieces in the mail from any agent. Is anybody like getting inundated by somebody who's got deep pockets? I think we're all in the same boat. So even a seasoned agent, top 1% like me, we're pulling back a little bit because if the sellers aren't really selling right the second, now I think they're coming, you know, but in the fall it was just a little bit tight. So I would say 10,000, 8,000 were we mailing out to recently, about 8,000, five, six neighborhoods. And that would be like a magazine. So we'd have the magazine and then we'd have a newsletter. So it'd be two pieces. But honestly, what I think I'm going to do is drop, we think Chris and I have been talking about dropping a couple of the neighborhoods and going maybe to like a five or 6,000 and hitting more frequently. So I think we'll probably drop two of the communities to pick up the frequency. I was on a panel about six weeks ago in Vancouver, Canada. And I was up there with um, three agents, a REMAX agent and a commercial agent and myself. And the REMAX agent had had a really interesting thing to say. She's like, a new agent can come in and dominate any market. The seasoned agent might be mailing out to all 2,000, but the new agent maybe has a budget of 400 houses. And they're going to hit it two or three times where the seasoned agent's hitting them all once for 2,000 homes one time. The agent who's hitting four or 500 homes two or three times is going to gain more market share in that niche of the neighborhood than that one person that's doing one touch to everything. So I would say start small, find the neighborhood you want, you know, figure out your budget. Maybe you can get like, like I said, like a lender partner on there with you or a home inspector. The home inspector's not going to have a huge benefit from it, but I would say probably a, a lender to partner with you and then just hit a section of it. And as you become more successful and gain more traction, then start adding another section as you go. We use EDDM, Every Door Direct Marketing. Any of you in here use EDDM through the United States Postal Service? Anybody familiar with that? So EDDM um, offers carrier routes. So you would go into the EDDM website and you pick the neighborhood, pick the zip code, you kind of zero down into the neighborhood, and it'll show you, you can highlight a route. So a lot of times they'll be right within the neighborhood. Sometimes you'll end up picking up a street across the street. There might be a little carryover. So like say it's Wild Horse Crossing. I'm just going to pull out a name. And so Wild Horse Crossing. So I might get 90% of it in Wild Horse Crossing out of 200 houses, but 20 of them are on two streets outside of the neighborhood. You can't pull back all of that. So all of those guys would be getting the Wild Horse Crossing postcard or newsletter, even though they're right outside the neighborhood. So that's the only thing is use a little bit of control because it's basically like a bulk mail that the postal carrier gets like a bulk of them and everybody gets one in the mail right? Everyone gets them in their mailbox. So you can't, or when somebody calls me and they're like, it's amazing to me how many people will, not that many people call, maybe one out of a thousand. Can you please take me off the mailing list? I'm like, seriously, like throw it in the garbage. How hard is it? And then, and I'm like, it's, I don't have control. It's not like it's being mailed directly to them. Like it's a, almost like a bulk permit, like everybody gets it. And so even though I could put on there, please don't drop in that mail, the postal carrier is not really paying attention to that. They're just throwing it in the mailbox, turn and burn, right? So I would say it's best to start out smaller with more touches. I read an article about a month or two ago, and it was interesting. There were, you guys probably saw this. There was a case study that was done, and they asked a community who the neighborhood expert was, like who their go-to realtor was in their community. And it was, like, did you see that? And there was like a ton of different people. Like there was no dominant agent in the neighborhood. So they made a fictitious agent 
like a fake agent, not even licensed agent. And then they sent it out for, was it six weeks? Six or eight weeks. They mailed every week. Boom, 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 boom. They went back. Who's the dominant agent? The agent, who's not even really an agent, who didn't ever sell a house, was the dominant agent. They were, that was one that was top of mind, who never sold anything. So it really goes to show you it's the frequency of who's showing up in the mail that's going to be top of mind at any given moment. Any other questions I can answer? Yes. Um, I have one time. I feel like um, a lot of it is emotive when you walk in the door. You know, so it's like you can it, you can get them in the door with it, but really, I mean, like if you virtually stage it online, it's going to look a little more attractive typically than a, a vacant house. But really what's going to sell it is what it's going to look like when they walk in the door. You're not going to trick anybody. Anybody really try to trick anyone like in a house, it doesn't work. It's kind of like dating. Eventually you sign on and you're not tricking anybody. So um, I, would say, I would say that yes, virtual staging is better than nothing. It's not cheap though. It's not cheap. Even you can do, like we do regular beds, which is kind of hard, but you can do blow up beds. I do not recommend boxes. I have agents that I've seen that literally take boxes. You guys have seen it. And they pile up the U-Haul boxes or Home Depot boxes and then they put a sheet. You can tell because they have really crisp edges like this. They're really sharp edges, and I'm like, I am not sitting on that thing. And then, and they don't look very good. I'm honestly, if it's going to be cheesy, don't do anything at all. Like, don't do cheesy. It doesn't do yourself any good. It doesn't your your clients any good. I would rather see no furniture, and do some things on the counters. Do some towels in the kitchen. You know, do a mirror over the fireplace. A couple little accessories. A few things in the bathroom, and spend a hundred or two hundred dollars. You can rotate through. Then put beds that are boxes because they end up falling over. And you can do blow up beds, um, but you have to go back and check them because they deflate. And it looks horrible <laughs> when you have a deflated bed and the pillows are all sideways. So you definitely want to go back and be, if you're going to do blow up beds, be committed to checking them every few days because it's not good. So, and then the kids jump on them. And there's, so I love the blow up beds on top of boxes because then they jump on them, the boxes are crushed, the bed's deflated. It's awesome. So you definitely want to kind of, if you're going to do it, do it well. I guess that's going to be the premise of my conversation here too. Whatever you do, do to the best of your ability. Okay, whether it's your marketing, whether it's your staging, even if you have to do it at a lower level, do it to the best you can. It's better to do something smaller and top notch than something super big and miss the, miss the mark. Okay, so listing appointments. You want to make sure you show up prepared. You want to do a top notch CMA. I've sold 600 and... 29, 630 pending and sold right now um, in my career. So that's a few. Now I've probably been on a thousand listing appointments. I don't get every single listing appointment I go on. Um, but I'm very competitive. I'm usually, I mean, I would say I probably get 80, 85% of them. It's rare that I don't get them and then I get annoyed. I'm like, what did I do? So um, it's kind of irritating. So, you know, but not everybody resonates or sometimes people have better relationships with other people. One of the things we do is we do these little books. So we have these little books. So we do our CMA in these. Um, Chris, what are these called again? Unibind, thank you. So we have a Unibind machine. My John L. Scott office used to have one. We bought one. So have any of you guys used these before? Yeah, you can customize them. So Unibind, U-N-I-B-I-N-D. And they have a little machine. So you print off your CMA, full color. Do not show up with a black and white CMA, please. Please, 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 please. And good quality. If you have to go to Kinko's and print it off, if you don't have a decent laser printer at home, go to Kinko's and print it off on nice paper. If you want a million dollar listing, you want to be a million dollar listing agent, you can't do cheesy. You can't do cheap, you can't do cheesy. So grab these, you put your little market, you see a man here, you press it together, you close it up, you heat up the machine, it sits in here, it heats up the glue, you squeeze it together a few times, and you have a nice little presentation book. It brands me in the back. Um, this is just some like Seattle, the like Gig Harbor Bridge, Mount Rainier, just some cool things in our area. So it's pretty, this one is serving the greater Puget Sound, but I also have them like specific to my neighborhood, Lake Taps and things like that. So I have them specific to the different neighborhoods, whether it's Pierce County or King County or Seattle. So then I look like the neighborhood expert in that area. You don't want to look like a fish out of water. So if you guys were trying to market to San Francisco, they would know you're kind of an outsider, right? So maybe you'd want branding that was 
you know, more San Francisco than Roseville or Sacramento. So, um, so put together your marketing plan, laying out your marketing services and the services you provide. Make sure you've studied all of the homes that are comparable to the subject property. So you guys know when you're doing your CMA, it'll ask you like suggested sales price. Don't you guys feel like it's hard to like figure out what that price is going to be before you get to the house? Um, I never, ever, ever put in a suggested sales price ever because you can't speak to something you don't know. Like if you've never seen the house, you can't honestly with integrity say it's going to sell for this. Now, you've done all your homework. You've looked at all the comps. The other thing I would suggest too, when you start farming to the neighborhood that you're going to farm to, start to show up to the open houses, start to show up to, like when it comes new on market, if, it, if you have an opportunity to pop in the open house or, or just preview the property, call the agent and say, hey, I just want to preview the property. I've got some buyers looking in the area. I just wanted to be able to do that. And if it's somebody you're friends with, just say, hey, would you mind? I just wanted to add this to my social media. I know it's a great new listing. I think there's some people on my Facebook or Instagram that this might work for. Would you mind if I quick, you know, just get a few pictures, 60 seconds of video there that I might be able to share it? and hopefully find a buyer for your listing. So that gives you an opportunity when you don't have your own listings to leverage and market someone else's. So kind of use that as an opportunity also to maybe show people that you're out there working, you're knowing the inventory. So when you choose a community, it's really important. You guys can't go back and see things that are already off the market. But from this day forward, you guys can start looking at homes that are on the market. And what I like to do is print off maybe a little sheet, like you can print off your little, you know, agent detail report, and then make notes on it and then put together a little notebook. So down the road, you know, if you forget, like if you have a really good retention, you may not need to make notes on it. You can make mental notes. But if you have a hard time with memory and you go see a thousand houses and things start to get confusing, maybe you make some notes of the pros and cons. So when you're going back and maybe you can categorize them, four bedroom between 500 and 700, you know, swimming pool, whatever, and you can start tabbing these in your notebook. And when you come and you can go to your appointment and say, here, Mr. Buyer and Seller, I've been through all 200 homes in the last 12 months that have been up for sale in this area. I know every single home in like the back of my hand. I know the pros, I know the cons, I know the strengths of yours versus those. So Mr. Buyer and Seller, when you hire me as the, as the agent to sell your home, I'm an expert in the community. When someone's like, well, why is your listing $100,000 in the other one? This one sold for this. Well, let me show you why. You can go to that. So that's going to help you gain authority as an expert in that neighborhood because there's no one else that's going to know the inventory like you do. And there's no one else that's going to be able to show them all of the wonderful reasons that they should pay a little bit more for that house than the house that Susie sold down the street. So that's a really easy way to kind of separate yourself out and to show yourself as a neighborhood expert in that community. So um, if you can intelligently speak with the prospective sellers in the community previously sold, you'll show yourself to be an authority within the community. We talked about not predetermining the price. Um, and then once I've gotten there, maybe I'll pull together all of the homes between, if I know it's going to be 600, I'm going to pull all the homes between 500 and 750, right? Because everybody knows everyone thinks their home is worth more than it is, right? myself included. We all do. We're all guilty of it. And so what you want to do is you want to kind of create, there might be some really great houses, even nicer than yours that are like at 500, but then there might be some that are 725 that are comparable. So you really want to kind of give them a wide swath. How many times have you been to an appointment and you think you're walking into one thing and you get there and it's totally different? Sometimes better, sometimes worse. And I'm like, my CMA is crap. Like, this doesn't do me any good. Like, everything that I thought I was walking into doesn't compare. And I'm like, alrighty then. So I don't even pull it out. Like, I've been to times where I've created a CMA. It doesn't come out of my bag. Because once I realized my pricing or what I was gauging toward doesn't apply to where I'm at, I'm going to do myself a disservice by doing it and say, okay, so I'm so glad I got to come here today. I, you know, it's really um, important that I see the property, I'm able to walk and you're able to show me all of the wonderful amenities about your house so we can determine a price and looking at the comps in the neighborhood to best determine where you are with the past so recent solds in the neighborhood. So it's okay to bury the CMA that you have and just bring out your marketing materials because you're better off with 
an honest conversation up front. Let's look at the pictures together. So you have your laptop, you prop it up. Take a look and see what Zillow is saying in Redfin, even though we hate Zillow and Redfin. Um, they can actually be our friend in situations like this. A lot of times um, people, sometimes they're fairly right on. I mean, in a, the newer the neighborhood and the more cookie cutter the neighborhood, I think the easier it is to accurately price. The more custom the home and the more unique features it has, the more difficult time it has. So if you have a cookie cutter neighborhood, a Lennar, and every third house is the same house, it's pretty easy. It's probably within two or three percent, right? Unless they've done some crazy, incredible upgrades and put an incredible pool in the backyard, which you'll get 25 cents on the dollar for. So um, you kind of have to know that too. Like, hey, I've got this amazing pool. Well, in Washington, not everybody wants a pool because it's raining like half the year. So um, so it's not going to have the same value. So in California or if we're in Arizona, if you sell a $3 million house in Arizona and there's not a pool in the backyard, is that a plus or a minus? Minus. But if you're in Washington and it's a $3 million house and has a pool in the backyard, it might be a wash. You know, I mean, they might have spent a million dollars on the pool, but, you know, for the three months out of the year, you can use it. It's not going to be as big of a deal. But it, location, or if you're in Florida, or if you're in Florida and you've got a beautiful pool in your backyard, but it doesn't have a screened-in porch, that's not good because the bugs are going to eat you. So you've got to, you know, you know your demographic, know your neighborhood, know what the expectation is, you know, going in. So I would say don't always, it's okay to throw away what you have. Because when you get on site and it's different, you can kind of, you have to shoot, you know, kind of shoot off the cuff a little bit, you know, and kind of look at that. So start walking them through the CMA. Okay, well, Zillow says it's worth 600. Redfin's saying 575. You're thinking it's worth seven. The MLS data is telling me 650. You know, this is what's sold recently. This is our trajectory. Um, you know, and I would say right now, I will take an overpriced listing all day long. I'll spend $300 on marketing on something that may or, or 500 on something that may or may not sell because I want to sign in the yard. I want an opportunity to sit the open house to meet the neighbors and an opportunity to pick up buyers from that. Whether it sells or not is secondary. I, you know, because it's all about getting your name in the community. It's all about giving you an opportunity to work. I want my 20 open house signs in the neighborhood. I want them being pulled from all around, coming to meet me, and hopefully me being able to get them to know, like, and trust me. I want to do business with me. So if somebody wants to overprice it 5 or 10%, I'll do it. You know, and so, you mean, obviously, you don't want to go a million dollars over, like, a $600,000 house. It's like a million six. But if they want $700, let us give it a shot. Market's going to dictate price. At the end of the day, I want you to get as much as you can. Because guess what? I'm paid on commission. I'm motivated to help you because... I get compensated on the sales price of your home. So you and I are on the same page. We just have to worry about what the market's going to say. So the market, the consumer today is more educated than ever because of Redfin and Zillow and algorithms and Realtor.com that feed them the information at a pace that was never, like 20 years ago when I became a realtor, that wasn't a thing. We're barely able to sign on the internet. You know what I mean? I'm like, what is that E for? You know, and so we, it, when I, it was just new when I became a real estate agent. And so things have changed a lot. And I feel like a lot of these algorithms have gotten a little bit better, but we can use them to, we take, a, take it for the blessing that it is and being able to pivot off of that and just extract the information that's beneficial to us. When you're looking for the school information, Redfin's great for school information, things like that. Don't send it to your clients. Don't send them the Redfin website. Don't send them the Zillow website. They're sending us Zillow and Redfin all the time. I could send them my company website for a thousand years. No one's sending it back to me. They're all sending me the screenshots from Zillow and Redfin. But as long as I'm the neighborhood expert and I'm the person that has a relationship with them, they're never going to win. But please don't purse. Like when you're taking a new listing, do not post your new listing from Zillow. Or from Redfin, like, look at my new listing. It's, if it's Caldwell Banker, it's Caldwell Banker. If it's EXP, it's EXP. If it's Remax, it's Remax. But do not use the competition because they want to undermine us. Whether we like it or not, you know, they're putting pressure. Redfin actually is probably lessened their commission fight a little bit less just because they haven't made a profit in 14 years they've been in business. So um, they have to start charging a little bit. But, um, but just kind of know that when you're doing that, you want to be advertising your brokerage, your business, your personal website. Do not give that to the competition. So let's see. Hard conversations. Have any of you guys been to a house 
where you get there and it's filthy, like gross, like awful. Yeah, back of the room. I remember one time I was in Tacoma and I got to this house and I swear rats were gonna fly out of it. And there was a mound of garbage, garbage in the middle of the garage. I had my coat like this and we're walking and I'm flipping the switches with my jacket. I wasn't touching it with my skin. I was flipping it and my client's like, I saw you. I'm like, dang it. I'm like, that is gross. I'm not touching it. So anyway, we we're laughing about it and stuff. I'm like, do you think there are rats are going to fly out of here? I'm like, I think so. So we got in and out of the garage really fast. So what I have found, because I don't want to hurt people's feelings, I want everybody to like me. I want to be friends with everyone. I don't want someone to you know, feel lesser. I grew up not having a lot. So I know what it feels like to not have like a fancy house or a fancy car, right? And so I don't want to hurt their feelings. So I wouldn't say anything. A brand new agent, I wouldn't say anything at all. The house smells like cat pee, dog poop. I mean, like it stinks. Or when you used to smoke in the house a lot. So do you guys remember when like we were growing up and your parents or grandparents or everybody would smoke inside the house and you'd walk in or you'd go to your best friend's house and you'd come home like a, if your parents didn't smoke, but your best friends did and you smelled like a chimney. When you came home, my mom's like, you stink. I'm like, I can't. Like, I, I was just at Jackie's. I didn't. It's not my fault. So anyway, um, so it used to be really common for us to smoke, people to be able to smoke inside their homes, right? Well, not so much anymore. I would say the last, you know, 15, 20 years, that's changed a lot. So like I've had clients' houses where they were chain smokers and the walls are nicotine yellow. And I'm like, okay. And I said, you guys, we have to have you start smoking outside or at minimum in the garage. Now, smoking outside is not comfortable in Washington because literally it rains like eight months out of the year. So, you know, I'm like, if you want this to sell, unfortunately these days, 98, 99% of people are not smoking in their homes anymore. So we're really going to have to have you start smoking outside or stop smoking at all. Um, during the listing. So um, that's not a fun conversation to have, but, but it's an important one because you don't want someone coming in there and they're like, oh man, this is so much work. It's still going to have a slight smell of nicotine, but not to the point where you just smoked a pack and then you walked out of the house. So it takes that down a little bit. Um, I've been to listings where there's so much, like Chris and I were going to take pictures one day and there was so much debris on the counters that they were filthy with like breadcrumbs and everything and they were ready for me to take pictures. And I was like, Alrighty then, um, do you have a paper towel? Because these cameras are amazing. They pick up the smallest piece of dust. Like, it's crazy. So, um, do you have something that I just see a couple crumbs here? I mean, it was like a half a cup. I'm like, is there like a couple crumbs here? I can just wipe them off because they pick up everything. And you've got such beautiful countertops for Mica that I want to be able to showcase those. And so, da -da -da -da. so it's amazing. Or have you guys ever been to a showing? I know this has happened to all of you. We've well, gone to a listing and they know it's pictures. You've had this on the schedule for days. You get there and we're literally going room by room by room, moving the piles for the pictures. And it's even worse. We do all of our stuff in-house now, which is a blessing. But when you're hiring the photographer and they're on a two-hour window and you're having to like make beds and take bedding and moving boxes and all of that, isn't it a nightmare? And then you guys have 5,000 other places you need to be too. So the more candid and honest we can be in these conversations up front of what the expectation is going to be, the better it is for you and for the people that are going to be shooting your videos and for the consumer. It's not easy. But what happened is, is I, when I was a new agent and I was younger, I'm 52 now, so let's tell you how old I am. But when I was in my early 30s um, and I became an agent, I didn't want to hurt people's feelings. Now I don't care. <laughs> I do. I do care. But, I, but, I, but what was happening, it was a disservice to them and it was a disservice to me because I was going to lean on the input, the feedback I was getting from the other agents. I'm going to wait till they tell me how horrible it is and I'm going to tell them. So then I'm like, okay, well, I'll just let them tell me how disgusting the house is and how it smells like dogs and whatever, and then I'll give it to them. So then I send it to them and they're like, okay, why didn't you share this with me? Like, why, if I hired you to be the industry professional, why didn't you tell me? I didn't see it. Like, that doesn't go over. Like, you, I mean, because they're like, seriously, I didn't want to hurt your feelings. Well, then I just set them up to fail. So they've hired me as their trusted advisor. And because I'm chicken and don't have the guts to tell them the truth, I've set them back. So you're better off figuring out how to do it in a kind manner. If you can't do it, spend a couple hundred dollars and hire a staging consultant to come in and have that hard conversation for you. 
I highly recommend that. And just say, oh my gosh, so one of the services that I offer that's amazing is I have um, a staging consultant that's going to come in and they're going to help you spend two hours with you, three hours with you, helping you get everything prepared for the listing and tell us all of the things that we need to do. And then it's someone else that's a bad guy. You spend a couple hundred dollars, best money you're ever going to spend. They're the heavy, you're the hero. And then you put that on the, their best, you put the, your clients out there um, on their best foot. They, they have the best opportunity to um, get their home sold. And then you're not having to make an awkward conversation and upset them with you. So I highly recommend that. That was one of the things I learned early on. Um, and now I'm able to have those conversations a little more readily because I've sold 1,200 houses. So it's a more comfortable conversation to have and tell them what people are looking for. I'm like, yeah, those pillows are not working. Too much clutter. That has to come down. This, 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 this. Sometimes it'll be blue tape. We're going to do a blue tape walkthrough of everything that's leaving the property. Good thing is I'm going to bring you boxes. I'm going to bring you boxes. I'm going to bring you tape. I'm going to bring you packing material. I'm going to bring you bubbles. And all of these things are going to go into the garage. And then your house is going to show and be more appealing to the majority of people. So those are just some things that you can offer to kind of soften the blow a little bit. But when it's in bad, bad repair and you're not comfortable having the conversations, bring someone else in, hire them to do the dirty work for you. So services that we offer, so we do professional photography on all of our listings. Um, we do it all in-house now, and if you guys want to know kind of how to do that, so we've actually, three of our daughters are licensed of our six kids, and two of them are getting licensed, but so we have a couple of our daughters now that Chris is trained to take our professional photography. They're all photo edited by Jenny in the Philippines, and she's fabulous. If you want Jenny, well, you guys all can't have her because she I won't have time for her, but she's awesome. So she... It's about 50 to $75 for her to professionally edit our photos. So when you're paying $800 to $1,000 for your photo shoot, all they're doing is snapping it, paying that photographer 100 or 150 bucks. All of them are going to the Philippines overnight and getting photo edited for $50. And then you're getting them back and they're keeping anywhere from four to $700 from your photo shoot. So we just took out the middle man, especially where we live too, because the weather can be inclement and it'll be like a second that the sun's gonna be out. So you gotta act fast. And so it gives us the ability to pivot and be a little bit more flexible by keeping some of that in-house. Plus in a lean market, it allows you to keep more money in your pocket and you can offer additional services. So that's why we bought the Matterport camera. I can, because at the end of the day, we all have time, right? Some of us more than others. But if money's tight, spend a little bit of money on the equipment and then do it yourself or hire an assistant that can do it with you and you can train them. So um, what we do is, you know, you bracket the photos, there's seven photos, three, one exposed, three under, three over, we send them to her, there'll be like 150 pictures, she puts them all together, we get them back the next day and they're fabulous. So what we normally used to spend $800 on, we spend about 75 with tip. So that saves us a lot of money. And if you guys want, you'll have access to my website. You can go on there and see our marketing. Everything's beautiful. It's really crisp and clear. Um, so we do aerial photography. We have our own drone. Um, we have our own Matterport. We do our own cinematic videos. And a lot of this now can be done with your iPhone or with your Android. Um, with cinematic videos, there's some cap cut and there's some software. The biggest thing is getting an image stabilizer. You don't want to have a video where everything's bouncing around. You want it to be smooth. Um, it's better for it to be, you know, short, crisp, and concise than to drag on forever and be choppy and not flow. So if you can get something out with a 30 or 60 second clip, on Instagram, on Facebook, on TikTok, it's really just showing you do a little reel showing you out there in the community, do something quick that you can turn. Um, it doesn't even have to be like a $2,000 video production. Now, like on a 2 or $3 million listing like I have, it might be a three-minute video because it's a 6,000 square foot house. And we've got a lot of rooms to cover. We've got view and stuff like that. But we're not going to put that on Instagram. It's going to be a 30 or 60 minute, a 30 or 60 second clip of that. But so a lot of this you can do, you know, on your phone, you know, clear, simple, concise. Um, so that's another thing that you can do to kind of keep the cost down. Um, we still do tour factory virtual tours because they have great school and neighborhood information on those. It's like $30 a month to be tour factory. So tour factory um, also spiders to like 
three dozen, five dozen websites you've never even heard of. Because the coolest thing about the internet is it just goes all over the country and all over the world, right? And we don't know, like there's websites on there you've never even heard of. So one of our daughters, who's one of our assistants, she goes ahead and uploads that. So the listing will come on, it'll go on all the standard places. And then Tour Factory. And the cool thing about that is it spiders out, but it also keeps a tra track record of where it was seen, which websites it was seen on. And it gives a weekly report. So you can kind of forward that, like with the Zillow report, like how many look Zillow. Because like my client yesterday, I have a two and a half million dollar listing in Bellevue. And they were like, hey, I noticed we only had one view. We're probably 10% over on price at this point. And I said, well, you know, let's give it another week, you know, see what we're getting. We have some flexibility on price. We've only been on the market 10 days. Let's not freak out yet. And I said, but the longer we sit on the market, the less saves you're going to get because the biggest bang is going to happen your first, you know, three or four days. And then it's expected. I said, so that's, and he doesn't know. He's like, you know, and I said, that's to be expected. And so you're going to start to see less saves and less activity. And then if we do a pricing, you know, improvement, then you're going to see a little bit more of an uptick again when we're at a lower price. A yes. Do you put language in your listing agreement about price reductions? I do not. I think that definitely you can, especially when you're talking to someone who's overpricing the listing by, say, 10 or 15 percent. I think, yeah, okay, Mr. Seller, um, I'm willing to go ahead and accept your price at 700. I think ultimately the market's probably at 625 to 650 is kind of where I think it's going to sell at. I hope we get 700. You know, as you know, I'm paid on commission. So the more you get, the more I get. So I'm on your, I mean, I want you to succeed. I want you to do well. Um, however, because if they're thinking, oh, you just want it to go fast. No, actually, I benefit too from it selling at a higher price. But um, just so you know, um, we need to kind of put in kind of an expectation. So I would say we'll start at 700, but in 14 days, in two weeks, we need to do about a 5% adjustment in price. And maybe instead of thirty-five thousand, we're doing twenty-five and get to six seventy-five. And then in about another two weeks, we probably need to be at six fifty. And hopefully, that'll be enough to get it sold. If for some reason we've kind of overshot the market, we're going to know in the first seven to ten days if we've overshot it because we still have a lack of inventory in the market. And if it hasn't sold by then, we're not getting showings and we're not getting saves right from the beginning. Like if we list it in the first two or three days, we don't have any activity. We probably want to move quickly because we definitely overshot the market. I don't think you want to wait two weeks because instead of a 5% adjustment, we're doing a 10% adjustment. So the faster we move on the price, the better likelihood you're going to get more money. But if you listed at 700 at their higher price, and this has happened to me, I just listed a house, needed about $200,000 worth of work. In my old neighborhood, we lived there 18 years, and it's on the golf course, about 3,000 square feet, needed eh, probably at least a couple hundred in updates. I thought we should be at 899. I don't. I wouldn't pay 899. Like I wouldn't have. And I'm like, I think we need to be at 899. Um, we need two to 250 in work, um, exterior, landscaping, interior. We've got seven foot ceilings in the basement. Like we have some issues. So we're like, but you know what? There's no inventory in the neighborhood neighborhood of 500 only listing I'm like why don't we go out at 950 and then just see where we go let's just try 950 because she's like what do you think about a million I think I said I think a million's high I think you know if we got 900 with the work that it needs it's probably a good day and you don't want to put any money into it so why don't we split the middle we'll go 950 so second day on market we get one showing the first day second day on market I have three or four showings I have a full price offer come in at 950 I'm like, cool, okay, we got a full price offer. I have an open house set for Saturday and Sunday, which I really, really, really wanted to sit because I wanted to get buyers. And then another offer came in, and she's like, the, one, the first offer in the morning, she's like, 950 cash, I want you to answer in two hours. I'm like, we're not going to do it. I have three other showings today. Um, and she was bossy. She was rude. She was so rude. And I'm like, I don't like you. I didn't. She's like, we're cash. I'm like, I don't care if you're cash. So I'm like, I'm not worried about appraisal. So she's like, well, we're cash. And I'm like, so? And so, um, so she's like, I want to answer in two hours. I'm like, well, I'm not going to give you an answer in two hours. And I was up in Vancouver speaking at another um, event for another agent. And um, I said, you know, I'm in Vancouver till this evening. We've got a couple more showings this afternoon. Um, let's reconnect, you know, early evening and we'll see where we're at. So the other agents are coming in. So I call the other agents to have the showings and hey, say, hey, just to let you know, I've got a full price cash offer coming in. I wanted you to know ahead of time. I'm okay telling the terms. So my client's fine telling the terms. So I know everything's going to come in above that if it comes in. I said full cash price cash offer. She wants an answer today. 
but I told her I was going to hold off and wait till you guys had a chance to see the property. So I'm going to set the expectation ahead of time that they know that they have to move if they like it. And I have a cash offer, so you're going to have to beat the cash. So that means you're going to have to probably waste some inspection. They want a cash offer and inspection. I'm like, whatever. And it needed, it was going to come up with a laundry list at the inspection. So I'm like, oh, great. And I'm at 900 anyway. So, um, so the next offer comes in, and they're at a million. I'm like, we're getting better. You know, so I have a million dollar offer that day. And so then the next person calls and I said, Hey, I've got a cash offer at a million. I got a cash offer at 950. I've got a finance offer at a million fifty. Just want to, or a million. Just want to let you know. So next thing you know, I have a million fifty offer. Because I'm leveraging everybody at this point. Like, I'm like, I'm going back and forth. I'm going to get as much money as possible. And so anyway, we closed out at a million sixty five financed with no inspection. So, um, which is cool for my client, you know what I mean? And but I was like bent on that 899. I'm like 899. But, and she would have gotten 950, you know, had I not worked it for her and leveraged, because I could have taken that 950 offer and stopped the negotiations that, that day and been done. That would have been easier for me you know, just to stop. But my responsibility to my client was to get her as much money as possible. Single mom, selling her house, got her 115000 of her list price, no inspection. So it was really pretty cool. And then, but the cash buyer who was 950 take it or leave it 10 hours before and kind of a jerk called me and I said, she's like, did we get it? And I said, no, $1,065,000 cash. Because she was like, we're not going to, we'll go to 1050000 and no more. I'm like, okay. And she was adamant. So she's like, what happened? I said, we just wrote it. We just got signed out a million sixty-five, no inspection. Why didn't you call me? I'm like, because an hour ago, you told me a million fifty with an inspection. That's all. And I took you at your word. So just be careful. Like, you know, don't expect the listing agent to call you back and say, is there anything left in the tank? And don't be condescending and rude and kind of um, like, yeah arrogant. I'm like, I'm trying to help you out here. Like, I don't have to be sharing as much information, trying to give you guys the best position. Ultimately, it's a seller's decision. Ultimately, it's what is your buyer willing to pay? But don't tell me this is your best offer and I accept a better offer and you come back to me, why didn't you call me? I'm not playing this game till midnight. Like, this is it. So I, I said, well, maybe next time you don't tell them that this is my best offer, take it or leave it. She's like, fine. So anyway, but she was not very happy with me. Yeah, but I was like, don't be, it's not my fault. Don't be mean to me. So anyway, some of the other things that we offer, moving services. So we'll give a $1,500 credit, like with our platinum package. And so I'll just give them a credit at closing. All of my clients, I'll drop off boxes to usually $100, $200 for the boxes from Home Depot or U-Haul. I do like 25 small, 25 medium, 10 large, get them started. Let me know if you need some more. I'll put some packing bubbles, some plate things in there, or the little glass things, um, tape, pens, and all that. And I'm like, if you need any more, let me know. I'm happy. Well, one time we had to come back with like five trips for a client, and the girls kept going. They're like, when's it going to end? I'm like, I don't think it's going to. Like literally, I think 300 boxes later, but it was like a couple million dollar listing, so it was fine. But I'm like, it's two miles from your house, the Lowe's. I literally think they thought I had like a Lowe's in my house, like in my thing. I was just, because we would go to the store, we'd buy them all, and we'd go drop them off. And we'd go back and drop them off. And then I'm like, if they're at Lowe's, keep them all at Lowe's. If they're Home Depot, keep them all at Home Depot. If they're U-Haul, keep them all at U-Haul. Because I didn't want the boxes to be mismatched. So then I'm like, that's how rit ridiculous I am, that I want them all to like match that we give them. So, um, but yeah, that's another thing that we do, is we offer um, boxes. House cleaning services. So if it's a really nice listing, and um, you want it to have a good deep clean, spend the $300 for like four or five hours to have it deep cleaned. So that's another added service. And it's like, oh my gosh. And with our package, it's so awesome. We're going to bring in Molly Maids and they're going to come in and they're going to take a five hour deep dive and get everything clean. Your bathrooms and your kitchen is going to sparkle. No person guy or a gal wants to be scrubbing their toilets and scrubbing their appliances, you know? And so you want to have those things looking really good. So just spend the few hundred dollars up front um, and do that. And if their house is already immaculate, say the nice thing is instead of using that up front, when you move out, we'll come in and we'll have everything done for you so you don't have to do any of the cleaning when you leave. So for $300, that's a three to, three to 500 it's a great point of difference between you and another agent. I want to take that off your plate. I don't want you to have to worry about cleaning the toilets and I have so many better things to be doing with your time that we're going to go ahead and we're going to have someone come in and they're going to take care of that for you. And, but if their house is already clean, she's like, it's already clean. And just say, great, so when you when you guys get everything out of the house, we're going to come in, we're going to spend four or five hours, they're going to do your move out clean. You can just walk away and not have to worry about any of it. You know, and then you're the hero once again. 
So you can do paid ads on social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook. We do property boosts on our KV Core at EXP. So we can boost the properties um, for $60. I boost it for seven days. And then it shows up in Facebook ads and it just kind of pops through there. So that's another thing that we do. Um, we have obviously high quality print materials, brochures, magazines, postcards that are really important. Um, and you want to make sure those are really good quality because it's a reflection on you. Um, when I was a new agent, this is what we would do. They would be color. And it's funny, we look back at our photos right now, our flyers, and they're so cheesy. But they were so much better than everybody else's at the time. You know, we were like, oh my gosh, we have the best flyers. I look back, I'm like, that is so embarrassing. And the photo that I had on there, because we couldn't rub two nickels together, was one of my Mary Kay sales director in my red suit. And it wasn't a JPEG. So Chris, bless his heart, cut me out. And so I would float. So he would take and erase me at the race, the background. And so my hair had little jags in it a little bit. It is kind of like, it almost looks like, I don't even know, is it The Incredibles? I don't know that person that has that black thing with her hair like this, that little whatever her name is with the black glasses. I looked like her. No, just kind of. But it was funny because we literally cut out a photo that was the best photo that I had and it's in the corner. And then it would be like this teal from the John L. Scott office, the laser printer, and we'd put off full color teal. Well, then laser printers weren't so good 20 years ago. So if it was cold, the ink would literally start flaking off the paper. And if you guys have had an agent for a while and back in the technology wasn't as good, like literally over the, a week out in the, in the box, you'd pull it and the, the ink was like falling off the paper. It was awesome. So it's funny when you look back at your old marketing materials, I don't know if you guys have ever reflected back to what you used to do that you thought was really awesome and today you're like, that is so embarrassing. It's funny how that happens. Another really big thing that we offer our clients when we're having a marketing um, appointment is we do mega open houses. So the bigger that you can blow, and this benefits the client, but it benefits you as well. So you say, one of the things we do opening weekend is you do a mega open house. So we advertise it everywhere. We put social media posts out. You can share it with all of your friends and family as well. We Like last weekend, my two daughters, Chris and I's two daughters, spent 12, uh, 10 hours canvassing the neighborhood that I have, the $2.4 million listing in Bellevue that's a little overpriced. 400 flyers through the neighborhood. And it's a hilly neighborhood. Their little cheeks were hurting, like up and down, up and down, up and down. And so I think they got 15,000 steps in the one day. And then last Saturday when I was open the house, they got 20,000 steps in. So there were 100 flyers for if they weren't home, they got one flyer. If they were home, it was another flyer inviting them to come. I met probably 50 sets of the neighbors at the open house the last two weekends, which is great. And they have my business card. And I'm super friendly and not pushy. It's like, hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, it's just kind of build a rapport. Like, are you a neighbor? And they're like, I am. I'm like, I'm so glad you're here. And I'm like, thank you. Because the neighbors kind of feel weird. I'm like, did you get the flyer? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, I'm so glad we had my daughters out there doing that. And so I'm like, it's so good to meet you. I'm like, everybody in your neighborhood's been so nice. Like, you guys have the friendliest neighborhood ever. Like, why is everyone so nice? Like, literally, it's the craziest thing ever. Everybody's super friendly. And um, I said, I just loved everybody that I met. I've met them on 127th, 129th, on the Ridge. Like, everybody's phenomenal. The elementary school's beautiful. They're like, we love it here. We never leave. I'm like, I can tell. I can see why. So I have gotten business over the years, multi-millions, like million, two million, three million dollar homes because they met me at another open house a year or two years before. And they're like, oh my gosh, we met you at the Jones house like two years ago. Or they'll call me, hey, I met you at open house like two years ago and you were so nice and super knowledgeable. I know you saw a lot of homes in the neighborhood. Would you mind coming over and listening to our house? I'm like, I would be honored. Thank you so much for remembering me. So it's really just being kind being knowledgeable, being friendly. Um, if there's anything you ever need, like if you want to come and see the neighbor's house and you're like, or curious about the price, keep my card. Don't hesitate to call me if you want to snoop in there. I can get you in when the neighbor's house goes up for sale. No pressure. Um, but just let me know. So be a valuable resource and just say, hey, you'll be finding some information coming in through the mail over the years, you know, from me. And just if there's anything I can do or help any of your friends and family that want to move into the neighborhood, please don't hesitate to let me know. So just kind of using that, we door knock. Um, so like pounding out in the neighborhood, you can do five, five, ten. So knocking on the door. So at a minimum, you know, five houses. So five houses on either side of your listing and ten across the street. I tried to trick one of my agents one day, and I said, "Okay, Corey. So you're gonna go to this open house, and you're gonna do ten, ten, twenty. Ten on the left, ten on the right, and twenty across the street." He's a brand new agent. He's like, "Kim, isn't that five, five, ten? I'm like. 
I was trying to trick you. I was like, dang it, I was trying to get better production out of you. So I'm like, yeah, it's 5'5", five, 10. Five, but if you want to be good, you better do 10, 10, 20. He's like, fine. So um, I said, just show up an hour, two hours early and just introduce yourself. Say, hey, we're having an open house. I don't know if you have any friends or family thinking about moving into the neighborhood or if you want to control who your neighbor is. You might want to help me find one. Or else I'll sell, sell it to somebody crazy. So... Um, so you can kind of engage them and just say, hey, here's a flyer. Um, you're probably curious on price. I just want to introduce myself. If you have any questions or if anything weird happens during the listing, here's my number. Don't hesitate to give me a call. Um, and if there's anything I can do in the future, let me know. By the way, this house is going to sell quickly. Have you thought about selling your home? And they're like, you know, actually, we're kind of probably going to move next year. OK, awesome. So if I meet someone and they're not in a hurry, I might is it okay if I give you a call back? And just we can kind of communicate, or maybe I can get them in. Um, and just kind of build a little rapport with them. It doesn't have to be pushy. Just get a little connection and just take advantage of that. The biggest thing is you want them to like you, so be nice. Um, dress nicely. Not, it doesn't have to be fancy, fancy, but don't show up in your Lululemon clothes. We all have cute Lululemon clothes, but you know, at least look semi-professional. You don't have to be over the top. You don't need to be in a three-piece suit. But it can be nice jeans and a sports coat or nice jeans and a nice you know, jacket or something like that. It can be slacks or a dress or something like that. It probably looks ridiculous for your stilettos walking the neighborhood. Doing sci you know. So don't look ridiculous. Like Dress appropriately for walking the neighborhood, not a street walker. <laughs> Like walk the neighborhood, cute Skechers, Keds, something, I don't know, Nikes. So anyway, you want to look appropriate for what you're doing. Um, and like for girls, like, you know, just be modest in it. You don't, like, no gal is going to send her husband out to the open house if all the goodies are out. <laughs> Nobody, you're not getting in that car. They're not getting in your car. So... Now turtlenecks, but let's not show everything. So just look appropriate, look professional. That goes for you guys also. So anyway, just that's a little tip that I've learned over the years. I think sometimes the more attractive you are or the more, you know, um, like a little model, the harder it is because, you know, I think a dowdy agent can do better than a model agent. Um, and I think just because sometimes, you know, you want to be, you want to, you want to be hired for your intelligence and your ability, not for your looks. So if you happen to be super, super attractive, you may want to just play that down a little bit and not go on sex appeal, go on knowledge. So that would be my advice for some of my people in the room. Um, you, want to, you want to be hired because you're smart. Unless he's single and really cute, then maybe, and you're single. <laughs> then we're talking about something different. Okay, so like a dating show here. Okay, so preparing the home for market. So we're talking about earlier about curb appeal and making sure that the listing um, shows well. It's important to start with a really good clean template when you pull up, right? So you want to have the yard looking good. If there's mole in the, do you guys have moles in California? Or are they just in Washington? where they pop up in your lawn and they put little dirt holes in there. So if you have molehills, knock them down, reseed them. Um, try to kill the mole if you can, otherwise it'll show up everywhere. But um, so you want to weed the flower beds, edge the grass, maybe throw some bark or mulch, maybe some fresh flowers, um, get the moss off of the gutters, clean the gutters so you don't have trees growing out of them. I had a $1.6 million house in Bellevue. I pulled up, and they met me the first time at Starbucks. They wouldn't show me where they lived first. They wanted to talk with me first to vet me. It was me and three other agents. So I had to get through the first interview process to get to the second interview process at their house. So then they get me to the house. And I pull up to this $1.6 million home, 4,800 square feet, beautiful house. There are trees growing on the roof, trees. So they have a shake roof, cedar shake roof. And there's some evergreen trees. It's Washington. They have a bunch of tiny little evergreen trees, like a thousand of them growing on the roof between all the cracks where the dirt is. And I walk up, I'm like, okay, Ben, you have a beautiful home. It is so, so pretty. However, we cannot have trees growing on the roof. Like, we can't. We have to fix this. Like, this is a problem. So he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, do you not look up? Like, the first thing I see. And you, don't you guys hate being a realtor? Because when you go home, you pick out all of the things that are wrong with your house. 
my poor husband. Um, I go, I come home and I'm like, we need to fix this and this and this and this. He's like, oh, we're trying, like, give me a break. We have a big house. It's like 20,000 square feet. So it's like a project in and of itself everywhere we turn, right? And so I come home from showing nice houses and I'm like, I want new carpet. I need to paint this. And when you have a big house, it's like incremental, like a little bit at a time, right? In a shifting market, really good time to buy a big house. So um, I bought it three and a half years ago before I knew there was a pandemic and a recession. So anyway, it's a good time. So curb appeal is important. No trees on your roof. No moss on your gutters. No moss on your roof. No cracked tiles sliding down the face of your house. You guys have a lot of stucco and a lot of tile here. Um, obviously, you don't want stucco with huge cracks going down the front of it. Get it filled. Get it painted. Um, make sure your gutters are clean. You don't have a lot of debris in there. Um, you want to make sure that the house is decluttered, and that can include dropping off boxes that you can help them with. Um, Touch-up paint. If you have the opportunity to do some touch-up paint, that's inexpensive and can go a long way. Um, carpets cleaned, especially if you have high, heavy traffic areas. Carpet cleaning goes a long way. Make sure your light fixtures are clean so they're not all dusty and gross and grimy. I'm a huge um, proponent of matching light bulbs. I don't like, like, have you guys ever seen a light bar with like eight and there's five different lights? Squirrely, incandescent, cool, 100 watt, 40 watt. I'm like, what is wrong with this picture? Like, I couldn't even get ready every morning because I'd be like so stressed out. Like, which light bulb am I going to take out? So um, if you have to, go to Costco, get all the same light bulbs and do it yourself. But don't leave it with like mismatched light bulbs because it's like the attention to detail. Just like you need attention to detail in your marketing, you need attention to detail when those agents walk through the door. Because when you have a good buyer's agent like I am and like most of you are, I'm looking for the details. I'm looking for the things that are giving my buyer a better opportunity to get a better price on the house. Because when you're a listing agent, you have a different hat than when you're a buyer's agent. When you're a listing agent, you want to get your client's top dollar. When you're a buyer's agent, you want to save your clients as much money as possible and get them the best deal possible, right? So we wear two different hats in real estate. So look at it as you would be walking in with a prospective buyer. What are the things that you would be pointing out to that prospective buyer? So look at it with a super critical eye and say, my job is to get you the most amount of money possible for your house. So we're going to look at this as a buyer. So step back with me. Let's start at the driveway. What do you see? Let's pretend like you don't live here. What do you see? OK, we need to edge the grass. We need to pull the weeds. We need to add some lime to get the grass to green up. We need to get those gutters cleaned. We need to maybe paint the front door. Maybe a new door handle will go a long way. Like when you walk up and you guys touch a really nice Baldwin door handle, like a really nice high-end door handle versus a cheapy little rusty one, doesn't that make a difference when it's your first impression? You got beautiful flowers, nice big planters. You walk in, you're like, this is nice. It kind of sets the stage, right? So you want to make sure when you're coaching your clients, you're a coach. Like you're a salesperson, but you're coaching them on how to help them get the most amount of money for their property. So all of those little details matter, even down to the light bulbs. They really do. Um, making sure the toilets are clean. I'm going to tell you a pube story. <laughs> My friend Kevin, we're not going to say Kevin's last name. Kevin is a single guy. I go to Kevin's condo, and he's dating Lindsay. And Lindsay's darling. Lindsay does not live there. I go to Kevin's house, and we're like going to take pictures. I've never seen so many everywhere. Everywhere. Little dark curly ones everywhere. They're on the edge of the shower, or the tub. So there's like this garden tub, and they're like, there's like a ledge like this. I'm like, how are they here? Like, I don't even know how they're like on the ledge of the tub. They're around the toilet. They're on the floor. They're crazy. They're everywhere. <laughs> and I'm just like, where, how are they everywhere? Well, I'm not. I'm not doing this. I'm not cleaning up somebody else's, you know, what's. They're not, it's not happening. I'm drawing the line here. Not getting toilet paper, not getting the broom. So I call Lindsay, the girlfriend. Lindsay, because I'm not comfortable having this conversation with Kevin about pubes. Very awkward. So I'm like, hi, Lindsay. She's like, hey, Kim, what's going on? I'm like, is Kevin with you? She's like, yes. I'm like, take me off speaker. So I said, Lindsay, have you been in the bathroom lately? She's like, no. I'm like, we've got a problem. She said, what? I said, there are pubes everywhere. She's like, seriously? I'm like, thousands of them. They're literally <laughs> everywhere. She's like, Kevin, in the car. You need to clean up the pubes. I'm just like, I'm just like girl. And I, I should have known, because she makes me look like a church mouse. And I was like, 
is it possible that we could just, before we take pictures, kind of get those cleaned up? She's like, I'm on it. I said, thank you. So you can call in help when you need help. But yeah, so those are the things you don't want to be flying around when you're taking pictures or when the house is being shown. So clean bathrooms are very good. So a fresh towel is clean, curb appeal, first thing when you walk in the front door, making sure it smells fresh. Don't over fragrance it, but fresh and clean, yes. That was after. That was after. I would say after. Get the listing and then sit through and say, okay, now we're going to do a walkthrough. And I want, my goal is to get you the most amount of money for your house. You and I are a team. We're like million vanilla, but real. Like we're like this, okay? My job is to help you make as much money as possible. Do I have permission to be honest with you? Is it okay if I. I want you, I want to get you the most amount of money. Is it okay if I tell you the truth, what I see? Because not only am I, am I a great listing agent, I'm a really, really great buyer's agent. So I want to take you through this if you were the buyer and what I would do pointing out to my buyer so you can see it through buyer's eyes instead of a seller's eyes. Because I know I am, I think my house is so much worth so much more than it is. We're all guilty of it. Like we, none of us, and we get blinded because we, you know, we don't see it because we live in it every single day. So let's step back. Let's go to the driveway and let's walk up. And what are these inexpensive things that we can do to help your house show in the best light to get you the most amount of money possible? So yeah, I think that just get it signed first before you trash them. Just kidding. Before you have those hard conversations. And, and, and you know, you'll get to know your client a little bit. You can take baby steps. But a lot of it can be done through if you feel like you're going to offend them, spend a couple hundred bucks and get the consultant in and tell the consultant, they know what they're there for. This is what they do. Make them the bad guy, not you. Like, oh my gosh, she was such a jerk. I can't believe she said that. I never would have said that. I don't know what she's talking about. The job is you want to keep your listing, right? You want to keep your listing. You don't want to offend them. So let somebody else do the offending, and then you can commiserate with them. Biggest thing, keep the listing. So Curbio. So Curbio, like um, Compass has like a concierge service that they do. How am I doing for time here? Oh, I'm close. I didn't think I could take up that much time. Apparently I can. Um, so Curbio, so um, using the concierge services, a lot of people are cash poor. They have a lot of equity, but they're cash poor right now. So use the services from those real estate companies where you can leverage their money and pay it at closing. They can pay for house cleaning. They can pay for landscaping. They can pay for dump runs. They can pay for a full kitchen remodel. They can pay for moving services. They can pay for staging services, all of those things. Roof cleaning, roof replacement. Leverage those if you have any questions, depending on which bro brokerage you're with let me know and I can kind of help point you in that direction because sometimes like one of my listings I just listed for sold for 2.6 million peeling paint rotted window sills like I'm like Greg we've got to get this work done I told you like a year ago we had it listed two years ago before none of it's been done and that was like two years ago, and it's only gotten worse it hasn't gotten better so and he was a professional guy and I said do you want to use your own money or do we want to use theirs and he's like let's use theirs and so we got the work done and got it sold right away but even multi-million dollar houses need work. So I would say, you know, sometimes it's light cosmetic, maybe it's interior paint, carpet. It might be a full kitchen or bathroom model that gives you a five times return on investment. Be careful where you're spending it with them, but they're pretty easy to navigate. So let me know and I can help you guys with that as well. Um, staging, like I talked about, um, I have a staging wing. I incrementally worked my way up from some bedding and vignette sets to I can stage probably eight houses on my own currently. Um, and so that I can offer as a free service. It's just really my labor um, of our employees and ourselves. And we wrap all of our furniture so everything's in great shape. Um, but the other thing you can do if you don't want to take that on because it is an undertaking um, say um, we offer a fifteen hundred dollar credit towards staging, or two thousand or three thousand, whatever you feel like you need it to be for your area, and the size of the house and the scale of the house for you to get the listing. Don't pay it up front. Say I will credit you twenty five hundred. I will credit you fifteen hundred at closing, so that if it never closes and pulls off, they've paid for it. And if they're crazy on price, it's not your problem. It's their problem then. And then they can pay for you know say I'll split the cost of the first month. After that, it's on you, or we'll keep it in there for 30 days and pull it from there. 
Social media, social media, there's no better avenue right now to get more bang for your buck than social media. Um, you need to be posting on Instagram, Facebook. Younger people, I would say 35 and under, probably more Instagram. 40 and older, probably a little more Facebook still. I'm on both. I probably, I'm 52, my demographic, I have friends on both. But more my peer, probably a little bit more heavily on Facebook. And then maybe a little bit less. I think I have like 1,500 friends on Instagram and 4,300 on Facebook. So it's a little bit, you know, more Facebook heavy. Um, I have a personal and a professional. Um, you can post your business stuff on your personal, about 70% personal, 30% professional on your professional page, 30% personal, 70% professional. So just flip flop it. So they kind of intertwine. People want to work with people they know, like, and trust. So that's really important. So um, you can post your kids, post your dogs, post your family, taking care of parents, that kind of thing. So post that. Another really good thing too is when you're out in your communities, um, if you don't have your Google My Business page set up already, get that set up right away. So Google My Business, Tom Ferry has some great training on Google My Business and the reason why you wanna do it and you wanna start putting your photos on there, previewing houses. Um, the algorithms are super smart and they'll start bringing you up and then as you build out that page you can start um, with lead opportunities to get leads and your names will come up as a listing a specialist in that market for real estate so if you haven't started start doing a deep dive on google my business and get that up and running and start adding photos you can't add like a hundred in a day or it'll it'll like freak out on you but add like five or ten so go to different parts of your cities and start adding things and while you're out in the business but i would say your social media um TikTok's another great way to kind of have an extensive reach as well um, so not only so showcasing your listing you're so showcasing you um, and what you're capable of and put, go live in an open house hey we're having a great turnout today we've had like 30 sets of people through um, we've had multiple offers on our listing coming in we've you know we're gonna be reviewing offers tomorrow at 6 if you want to try to get in and take a look at it please give me a call let me know um, open houses too we're gonna talk about that really quickly and that'll be my last little tip here open house strategy um, social media posts regarding open open houses, as much signage as possible. You can never have too many signs, ever. Um, if you've got a spouse or kids that can help or an assistant, um, so you can be at the open house meeting the neighbors and let somebody else pay them 20 or 25 an hour to go put the signs out. We put balloons on all of our signs because I want to drive as much traffic. I want to point a difference from the other real estate signs. So go to the grocery store, buy a dozen balloons for $16, $18, put them on there. Um, the mylar ones, the rubber, the latex ones last about a day in our area. They might last at two days here because the weather climate's a little bit different. Um, otherwise, you can go to the Dollar Tree for $1.25 and grab like the star ones, the mylar ones, and those will last a couple days. And then you can always get one of those little balloon fillers, those little birthday balloon fillers, because the Dollar Tree ones, those little mylar ones will last a little longer. And then you can just put it in and do a little refresh. So you could probably get away with one set of balloons for $20, $30 of helium in the little tank and a $30 investment in balloons for all of your open houses for the entire month. Um, if you're looking for business, you need to sit open houses uh, during the week. I would do Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Many times in my career, I would sit double open houses, even having six children. I would do like a 10 to 1 and a 1 to 4. They'd be in the same neighborhood. I'd leave the one five minutes early, get to the other one five minutes late, have somebody in the middle, and sit six hours of open houses. Um, the 2.4 I just did the day before Easter, they didn't want showings on Good Friday or on Easter, of course. I wasn't going to sit in open house on Easter. But um, I did an 11 to 5 on, e on the day before Easter. We had probably 35 sets of people through. So I did a six-hour open house because we weren't doing showings on Friday or Sunday. If I'm going to be there, I might as well be there. So if it's a vacant house and you're putting all of the time and effort or you want to take off like Sunday for family day or something like that or Saturday, um, then just do longer ones on the other day. You're going to put all the signs out, put all the time in, make it worth your while. It just takes one buyer, right? So put the time in. Um, clipboards with evaluation sheets. So we just bought some clipboards and they can evaluate um, the property, um, you know, um, It'll have like, are you working with an agent, not working with an agent? Um, and maybe you can say, hey, if you can help me fill this out, it's a pricing sheet for my client. Any pros and cons about the property? Um, I'll give you a five dollar Starbucks card at the end if you can get this back to me. If you want to do that, or you don't have to, but it, you know they'll go, hey, I'll get five bucks and start free Starbucks. So they'll trade that off. But then it'll ask you, are you working with an agent? 
you know, da 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 da. We've done iPad giveaways where we've given away an iPad um, or something like that. So everybody after the end of the weekend, they drop their name in and we give them a call and say, hey, we, you know, want an iPad or something like that. So in a more expensive house, you can do something like that. Um, you can do a refreshments, food truck. We usually do coffee, like a coffee station, water, cookies. Crumble cookies are a big hit. I don't know if you guys have a crumble cookie nearby, but those are really tasty. And you can get 75 of them for like 50 bucks, so the smaller ones. So maybe if your open house can't fit that many, but you've got a friend, maybe you guys split them for your two open houses. And then, you know, you have those cute little cookies that you can give them at the open house. Um, we've had harpists. We've had violinists, like at high-end listings. When they walk in, I've got like a beautiful harp player, and she's playing rock music. Like she's playing ACDC on a harp. It's pretty cool. So... Um, um, and so Gail would love it. So Gail DeMarco, where are you? Are you here still, Gail? Um, she left. Gail's awesome. But uh, she used to photograph rocks, rock bands. So, um, but yeah, so we'll have that. So it kind of sets the tone where it's like, ooh, this is really elegant. So she'll be over there playing like literally like rock music on a, on a cello, or, yeah, cello, or a harp. We have a harp and a cello. We've had violinists. So live music's kind of good. Uh, food trucks are cool. We've had a Porsche salesman. We've had like some nice, we've had Ferraris in the driveway. We've had Porsches in the driveway. So you get, you know, a luxury car dealer to come in if it's a two, three million dollar listing, kind of showcase that there. Um, inviting your Facebook and Instagram friends to come say hello at your new listing. Um, one thing my old brokerage used to do is they would have like a win a trip form. So quarterly there would be a trip. So what you could do is like, hey, we have a $2,000 trip to Hawaii. So for that quarter, th second quarter, third quarter, me is third quarter, anybody who comes to my open houses, and if you want to spend $2,000, I mean, you could give out $5 gift cards or spend all the $5, save all the $5 gift cards and have them enter into a drawing for $1,000 to San Francisco or wherever you want to do, send them to a football game or a baseball game. But they enter it into a drawing, and you have a drawing quarterly, and it's a really big event. And say, hey, if you drop your information in here, I'm doing a quarterly drawing for this, and we'll make a big announcement of all of that. So that's something you can kind of make it a big event um, there. Um, another thing, too, I would be adding um, QR codes to all of your marketing material tying back to your website. Oh, and you can also do like a landing page for that particular home. So then they can go to the landing page. And th we did this with Zillow back in the day because they would only allow you to link one virtual tour. So we created a landing page that so would have like the cinematic, the virtual tour, the 3D tour, the professional photography, all in one link. And that link from the landing page would go on to Zillow. So when someone would open it up, they would see all of it, my open house schedule, the school information, we would have a landing page with like five different things that normally would have only been one link, it would have five links. So creating a landing page for that listing with a QR code. Um, also, um, another thing that we um, have utilized is a company called Ogvo for reviews. Reviews are still really important. Um, so if you do reviews, um, Siri uses Yelp reviews. So the cool thing about it, I'm horrible asking for reviews. I just feel so awkward at the end. You should ask them in the beginning when they love you, when they got an offer, before everything goes sideways. Ways. Just kidding. So, and then I hate you, and it's your fault, and you, it wasn't really your fault. But, um, you can ask for the review, like when you get them 100,000 over, like, oh my gosh, would you mind sending out this review, for, uh, filling out this review for me? But what Ogvo does is it um, verifies, it like takes only four and five star reviews and allows them to post. If it's less than a four star review, it will send it back to you and gives you an opportunity to maybe try to make things right with that consumer and see if they'll maybe evaluate, reevaluate that review before it gets posted to a public website. So that's kind of nice. But Siri does use Yelp reviews. So when someone's looking, Siri, find me a real estate agent in Roseville, then you, if you're on there, that'll give you a better shot of getting the listing. Um, I've got just a couple minutes here. Anybody have any questions that I can answer for them um, before I wrap up? Uh, you were advising a new agent or someone yeah. fired up and you were talking about getting the price point up higher. Yeah. Brand new agent, I'd probably go bread and more bread and butter because it's really hard without a good book of business to go out and get multi-million dollar listings. It's, it is more competitive, not that it can't happen, but I would rather, I think my chance of securing it is probably 80% and more of a bread and butter, you know, blue collar 
you know, being able to build that rapport, the bar is quite a bit higher, plus the expense. I mean, I might spend a thousand or two thousand dollars on a high end listing. Like I advertise also in the luxury home marketing magazine, things like that. So if you are a newer agent, there's a good chance you don't have deep, deep pockets to do all of that. So I would say get your feet wet and get your get your chops on the four to five to six hundred thousand dollar listings. Get that you know, get comfortable and then go to seven or eight and then eight to a million and then from there. Yes. Thank you. I don't know if I call this fluff or not, but when you go to a listing, what is the fluffy stuff that you do as far as like, do you bring a listing gift with you? Do you, I mean, what do you do to like I don't. welcome? Yeah, I don't. I, um, I think there are some agents that do that. I did bring some flowers to a gal whose mom died a few months ago and she didn't use me. The only time I've ever brought in flowers because I felt badly. I was coming from Seattle, heading about an hour south. It was a cruddy little condo. It was gross. And it was it needed a rehab. And I think because I told her she really needed to, they needed to put a new kitchen in because there were no cupboards on there. I mean, it was really bad. But I felt like I saw these beautiful flowers at the gas station. And I was like, I'm going to bring her flowers. Her mom just died. And my mom died like two years ago. So I know what it's like to have my mom die. So I'm like, these are beautiful. I wanted them for myself. And all the way there, I wanted to keep them for myself. Then after she told me I didn't get the listing, I really wish I kept the flowers for myself. <laughs> Never again will I bring flowers. No, but most of the time, I just, I'm just nice. I don't bribe them. I don't send them cookies. I have friends that send cookies ahead of time. I just try to be nice and all of that. I don't really send a thank you card afterwards or anything like that. I should, but I don't. Yes. Well, you need to have it. I live in a gated community where open houses aren't allowed. So my $2.8 million listing right now, it stinks because there's no inventory on the lake and we can't do open houses because they're prohibited. So if it's a gated community, most of the time you can get access and get the gate open for three hours. My neighborhood, no open houses are allowed. So there's nothing we can do. Yes. Yeah, I was just curious if you call or circle prospect your um, farms. I have not personally. I do recommend it, though, and you can get mailing lists. Um, I think Boomtown, there's some different places you can get mailing lists, and the escrow company has a list of those for you as well. I don't. Should I? Yes. Do I? No. There's a lot of things. Is The funny thing is, this is a funny little saying I have. I do the business, we do the business that we do in spite of me. In spite of me. Because if I did what I'm supposed to do, we would be doing so much better than we're doing right now. So that's the irony is if you just even to 10% more every quarter than you did the month before, like in five quarters, you're 50% better than you were the year before. So just like slight changes, right? It doesn't have to be big, monumental. But I just get, I put a lot on my plate is my problem is I am an overachiever and I probably commit to more than I should. I need to step back a little bit and time blocking, time blocking is huge. Put your time block, make a commitment to yourself, and follow through is the biggest thing. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have kids? How old are they? Three. Okay, so going to go to preschool. I would start like getting involved in the community, getting involved at preschool. If you go to church, Sunday school, church, um, community events, activities, that's where a lot of mine came from. I was a Little League baseball president for seven years in our local Little League. I gave up two years. I gave that up. This is my third season not being on the board, but I was on the Little League board for 11 years. And for the second, the third year, I went to the board meeting. He's like, do not come back to the president, whatever you do. And I was like, the president position came open. So I came home, I'm like, guess what? I'm the president. He's like, I'm going to kill you. But um, so I served for seven years. We went from 400 kids to 800 kids and met a lot of families. I can tie two actual deals back to Little League. It probably cost us a million dollars in lost commission from my time. But it wasn't about the money. It was about the kids. I love baseball. I think I have lipstick on my, te my teeth again. Sorry. So I love the kids and I love baseball. So it's more about giving back and not, it's everything can't be about work all the time. So that gave me joy. I wanted to be a school teacher originally. So that's kind of what I did. So I would say get involved in the community, get involved at your church, get involved in, you know, at the gym, whatever it is, and start just building relationships organically and be authentic. Be yourself. Yes. Uh, when you mentioned um, doing the, 
your daughter's dropping flyers mm -hmm. for the open house. You said you have two different flyers. What are the differences? So one, um, I don't even, I didn't even read them. Chris, what were the flyers? <laughs> One was like, they're both open house related, but one was like, hey, sorry, we missed you. One was like a fire flyer, you called it? If you want to, if you want to email me, I'll send you whatever it was that they made. I didn't even read them. I was like, go, people, go. I'm not doing it. So, <laughs> just kidding. But yeah, so one was like, hey, sorry, we missed you. We're having an open house. Come by and see us. But neighbors were like, oh, yeah, we got a little note on the door. I'm like, oh, my minions. They were out. So, but I honestly, I didn't even read it. Can we do one more question? Yes. The last part? Is Jenny that you oh, you know, Jenny only edits our photos. So you don't have a social media uh, Chris and our daughter Faith does that primarily, but that's a great idea. Have your QR code back, go back to like your Facebook or your Instagram. I hadn't even thought about that, so that's brilliant. So um, it can go back to your listing. It can go back to a community page that you create. I have a friend. You, you guys write this down. Write down the Puyallup. I'm going to spell it for you. P U Y A L L U P P U Y A L L U P the Puyallup Reel. So follow that on Facebook and Instagram. It's one of my agents at EXP in my group, and they built a phenomenal community page talking about all things in the community, parks, um, shopping, homes, all things real estate and fun in the area. If you guys want to create a community landing page, I think that's a great one to emulate. So take a look at that, and feel free to reach out to my friend Dennis on there and just tell him I told him you could. So just say Kim said I could reach out to you. Um, but he's a great guy. But and that's another one to follow for a community page. So you can tie it back to whatever. But I think if you're trying to be an expert in a certain community, it doesn't even have to be like you can do all of Roseville or it could be a sub you know, subsection of a neighborhood or something like that. But I'll be available like after this. I don't want to take any more of your guys' time. My handles and my phone number, that's my cell phone number. That's my email address and my page. Those are my personal um, Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and YouTube. So feel free to reach out to me anytime you guys want. You have questions, you want any of this material sent to you, I would be happy to do that. Um, if I can be of service in any way, please let me know. And thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Great job, Kim. Everybody stand up, stand up and give her a round of applause, please. Yeah. All right, we'll see you back here next month for Bill Pipes. Have a great day, all.